Good morning, everyone. It is the appointed hour. We have a quorum present. Life is good. We'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. This meeting will be conducted in compliance with Nebraska's open meeting laws, a copy of which is on the back wall. Could we please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all for that. Uh, Mr. Clerk, could we please have the roll call? Yes. So Board of Equalization, uh, Commissioner Borgeson is absent. Commissioner Boyle? Here. Commissioner Cavanaugh is absent. Commissioner Kraft? Here. Commissioner Morgan? Here. Commissioner Rogers? Here. Mr. Chair? Here. Thank you. Uh, first item for the Board of Equalization's consideration, item A, approval of the minutes from last week's meeting, item B, setting one week from today is the next date for hearing on cert certified assessment corrections. Questions or comments to either of these items? Then, Mr. Clerk, could we please vote? Or Ellen? Uh, Commissioner Boyle's vote won't appear on the screen. <laughs> but uh, he is voting yes. It's kind of like the Iowa caucuses, huh? That's <laughs> <laughs> giving. <laughs> I shouldn't go there. <laughs> Motion passes five to zero. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Clerk. Citizens' comments. Does anybody wish to address the Board of Equalization? Uh, during every one of our board meetings, we do have the opportunity for anyone to address this board on any item not on the agenda. Okay. Seeing no one, we will move on to Resolution D. Oh, there's, oh, excuse me. Excuse me. I'm sorry. All right. Well, a little slow getting up. Good quite, morning. Qu quite all right. Good morning. Uh, you? Michael Young, 8425 Sheffield Street. Uh, I come up here to talk about your agenda today, and I appreciate the minutes and opportunity to speak in front of you all. Later on your agenda, you have a uh, resolution to remove the citizens comments from your meeting agenda. And as an elected and appointed official for now over a decade, I find it imperative to have moments just like we're having here today to have an open discussion at any time where public can have comments. Of course, we want to have open discourse uh, and we want to have open comment that is allowable, that allows us to have great communication. There are times that we do allow public comment and unfortunately there becomes unruly. So we want it to be safe, we want it to be just, and we want it to be heard. But what I definitely do not uh, agree with is definitely removing the ability to have open comments before any meeting. Henceforth, I would not be able to be here unless I was on an agenda. So with that said, um, being the chair of the Transit Authority for the city, um, recently removed as the Vice President of Metro Community College. Again, I'm here as Michael Young myself. I appreciate your time and hope that we continue to have this discussion openly. Thank you. 
Thank you, Michael. If Commissioner Boyle, if I may, because this is on the agenda later, uh, if it's all right, I would ask if we can hold off on our responses until we actually get to that point on the agenda. No, I, I do need to respond now. I, the floor is yours, Commissioner. Okay. Uh, Mr. Young, I, uh, my name is Mike Boyle. I'm a citizen as well of this community, and uh, this is something that we are not allowed to do when we have this open mic uh, session that comes up later. Uh, and I find it very confining and very um, uh, un-American for us not to be able to answer the questions that constituents have and that bring up about, for example, immigration last week. We had to sit here like so many uh, dummies and just sit here and could not explain why we did what we did because the, the Attorney General, uh, through our Deputy County Attorney, has told us we cannot speak. We can't talk. So we can't have a conversation and answer the complaints and the concerns and the views of our constituents. And I find it uh, absolutely uh, confining and unreasonable. And on occasion, the last time I tried, I got up to walk around to speak at a citizen to respond and get in a conversation with the person who spoke, and I was ruled out of order. And so uh, it's, it's very stifling, and I think it's unfair to the citizens not to be able to uh, account to you uh, for what we do. And that's what happened last week. And uh, uh, I don't know if, that's why I put this on the agenda, because we need to talk about it. And I'm not sure what we'll do. The city council doesn't have these kinds of, of open mic. Uh, the legislature certainly doesn't. Uh, and so we're the ones who, uh, you know, they talk about United Nations and other things and bring up things that I think we need to be accountable to you and answer. And under this opinion, we're told to be quiet. Mm -hmm. And I think you can tell I don't like to be quiet. <laughs> Well, so I, we owe you explanations about this, and we'll talk about it later when it's on the agenda again, but I did want to respond to you because uh, I'm not I am not for stifling uh, public comment. I am all for it. We need to find a way to do this uh, that is fair uh, to everyone, including you. You deserve answers. Well, and under this system, we can't answer you. If, if I may, this is on the agenda, and, yeah. and I welcome the conversation. Yep. I truly do, but I would prefer if it came where it's on the agenda. I agree, if, too, if but I, did, right. I didn't want to miss the chance because I thought you may, <laughs> yeah. I might have to leave. But I, I wanted to tell you that I would. you're on point. Yep. We're not trying to stifle this, and I'm certainly not. Uh, we need to figure out a way to become more responsive, and right now we are not responsive. Okay, thanks a lot. I appreciate your coming by. If you have time, you're welcome to sit, sit around. <clears throat> we will shortly have more conversation on this. I would prefer that that occur during the Board of Commissioners meeting than the Board of Equalization. Absolutely. Uh, but what I'll do is just have this quick comment, and then I'll, I'll table it. Um, Commissioner Boyle, to your point, I had the very same thing over the Transit Authority. I had a guest come up. And by statute, right. we are not allowed to respond because it's not fair to folks who are going to attend and not attend uh, right. to have that discussion on the agenda. However, that I, d I think that the open forum still should continue because you can still receive that feedback. Even though you cannot respond, you are a bit stuck. There are some legalese that is tied behind that. Uh, but I do think it is very important that we at least receive that. And, you know, hearing about service and transit, hearing about right. customer service, that's a big deal over there. So not being able to have a thoughtful conversation to just receive um, I think it's something that we definitely should continue. Thank you, Commissioner. For your Thank time. you both. And Thank you very much. And we will have more conversation on this further down on the agenda when it comes up. Uh, anybody else wishing to address the Board of Equalization? If not, we have two protests on the agenda. The first is a protest of. A oh, we didn't vote on item D yet. Excuse me. Uh, item D: approving application for tax exemptions on motor vehicles recommended for approval by the County Treasurer. We have a motion on a second. Questions or comments regarding this? Then could we please vote? Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. Now we move down to the protests. Item E, special evaluation. Um, Real quick, Chair, uh, Commissioner Cavanaugh, do you, do you want to vote on item D? Yes. Vote, vote yes. Okay, I'll note for the record, uh, item B passes 6-0 with Commissioner Cavanaugh's vote. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Goodwillie. Good morning, Commissioners. Mike Goodwillie, Douglas County Assessor, Register of Deeds Office. Um, we have three parcels uh, that uh, our office uh, uh, sought to uh, disqualify from uh, special valuation. 
um, at the end of uh, last year. Let me take a little bit of time to synopsize how we got here. I've had a little discussion with counsel for the taxpayer. There are some moving parts in this and a, a misstep or two, and I'd like to kind of, before even talking about any of the merits, kind of get us down to we, so, you know, the players, we know the players without a scorecard if we can. Um, there are three parcels. All of them are south of, uh, almost immediately south of West Dodge Road, and they straddle 192nd Street. Um, the first of the protest, item E, is a six-acre parcel uh, on the west side of 192nd Street. Uh, the other two parcels are on the east side of, the, of 192nd Street. They did not start life as these parcels. Um, let's start with the west side parcel. It was part of a 20-acre parcel uh, that uh, was receiving special valuation in 2019, and it was both subdivided and in, into a it was subdivided into a number of parcels, which is not a green belt disqualifying event, uh, but a number of those subdivided parcels were put into SIDs, which is. A number of them were not all of them. Um, the same story is true of the parcels on the east side. Uh, they were part of a, a much larger parcel that went through some subdivision. A number of parcels went into SID. And when that occurred, our office sent out disqualification letters uh, based on inclusion in the SIDs. I guess there was one SID. Unfortunately, we erred on these three parcels. We included them with the SID disqualifications when, in fact, they were not included in an SID. We recognized our mistake a couple of days later, and because we had viewed the parcels and didn't think they were any longer being used for agricultural purposes, we sent them a second letter dated December 19th, um, seeking to disqualify the parcels uh, based on failure to primarily, or to, uh, to have a primary use of agriculture on those parcels. So I guess for your purposes, and I, I don't blame them for doing this, uh, they filed uh, protests both based on the December 16th SID letter and the December 19th use letter. And I guess what I want to get out of the way is um, the December 16th letter for these parcels, that's not grounds for, uh, we withdraw that, that's not grounds for removing special valuation from this parcel. The discussion today uh, should uh, revolve around use as opposed to being in an SID. And I think that's a fair characterization of, of what, what those issues are and how we got here. I suppose if, if opposing counsel disagrees, they can clarify when it's, when it's their turn. Now, with respect to the, the merits, I've provided all of you a packet, or at least you should have one, um, complete with affidavits and pictures and all sorts of things. Let's start with the west side parcels first. The west side parcel provides an interesting... Uh, an interesting argument. Uh, this was the subject of a Greenbelt dispute uh, back in 2018 uh, in which this board uh, disapproved a, a special valuation application. Currently that case is being litigated at Turk and I think it goes to trial this month. Um, the, the property owner uh, at that time, at the county board meeting at that time claimed, and we had no reason to doubt it, uh, that they planted alfalfa in September of 2018. Um, and actually, in some of the pictures that we have, you can see in 2019 some alfalfa growing. Now, why did we disqualify? Well, if you look at the pictures, you can see the alfalfa was cut, was never harvested and never sold. And the reason it was never harvested and never sold, well, uh, that's the interesting question it provides, is can you have commercial production of agricultural activity or commercial production of agricultural products, which is the, the test for whether something is primarily used for agriculture, if you don't ever really harvest or sell anything? Um, now, the reason for the failure to harvest and sell was that there was a, a, a lot of debris on the parcel that made it impossible to do that. But the debris uh, seems to have come from 
the initial grading of imp uh, demo demolition in, uh, of improvements on that parcel and the grading of that parcel in, in preparation for development. Um, essentially, they pushed debris around the parcel, making it impossible to harvest. Um, I, have, I have included an affidavit from the gentleman who leases uh, the parcel, um, ostensibly for, for farming, and he indicates, well, he might have a crop in 2020. So, I, you know, I mean, this is kind of a, well, we expect that to happen, but it hasn't happened yet. Back in 2018, they expected to have a crop in 2019 that they would sell. Um, and then finally, for this parcel, there are some pictures in the packet I've given you in Exhibit E that looks like there's considerable amount of grading work going on, uh, big piles of gravel, uh, all sorts of... Uh, all sorts of piping for development and so forth. Uh, at a minimum, maybe it looks like a staging area for, for some other developmental work that's going on. Um, the east Mr. side. Mr. Goodwill, is yes. there a chance? And I appreciate how you're explaining this. Is there a chance we can have that on the screen so some of the other oh. people could see that? Sure. I mean, and I'm sorry to interrupt. You. No, no, That's it's good fine. Point. Good point. I was hoping you guys would follow along because I. The one thing I am not is an audio-visual sort of guy. <laughs> Mike Boyle. <is> okay. <laughs> Thank okay. you very much. Is that, uh, that, no, that's, so everybody can kind of see what you... Yeah, that's, is that helping anything? No. Dan, I need some help. <laughs> yeah, turn the face off. Oh, okay. Walk me, walk me through that, would you? Oh, okay, thanks. God, I hope so. <laughs> but that's not pulling up. Sure, Dan. It sounded so simple. Uh, well, uh, it's so. Uh, so which one do you want? Um, let's do this parcel first. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's scroll down. Is that what I need to do? There's a full screen. Maybe you can do which? This one here. Okay. Cool. Okay. Great. So here's the overhead of the parcel, and the wider outline is the original parcel, and then the parcel that's being protested is this piece here. And as we scroll down, this is from summertime. And you can see there's, there's stuff growing and that there's alfalfa and it's lying there. And it's still lying there. And then this uh, uh, was done later in August and it hasn't been picked up. And then... The, was that the wet season? No, actually the reason they didn't pick it up was that there was construction debris all over it and it would damage the farmer's equipment. Well, no, no, I mean, well, no, demolition debris is probably better put. Well, but here's what they did. Initially, in fact, I've, it, was, it, it was wet when they planted in September of 18. I don't know if it did or it didn't. I don't think so. But here's, but here's what, what we saw in October on this parcel. Well, I, I, th I think they've obviously platted and subdivided the parcel. 
Uh, some of it's in SID. I suspect they're probably going to try and do their development in stages that some of those parcels they'll, they'll put improvements on. And it looks like maybe they were using that as some kind of a staging area for, for doing that sort of work. Well, we're, value, we're, we, we're seeking to remove special valuation because we don't think it's being used for agriculture anymore. Well, the reason there's, and the reason there's debris on the parcel that prevents the harvesting of crop is back uh, uh, after the property owners bought it, there were some improvements, some farm improvements on the property, a farmhouse, some outbuildings. They knocked all that stuff down. They took away some of the debris. Uh, but they ended up pushing around pieces of the foundation uh, all over the the parcel when they graded initially. Uh, that prevents the prevents the farmer from actually picking up and harvesting and selling the crop. I mean, it isn't like they're it isn't like they're losing out because of some crop blight. It isn't like they're losing out because of some flooding. Their efforts to develop and grade made it hard, uh, if not impossible, to get a crop on this particular parcel. Do you know why they tore the buildings down? Yeah, they're going to develop the damn thing. No. Did you know the sheriff called him? Did you know about the sheriff's office? I did not know about the sheriff. Well, they'll tell you about it maybe when they come up. But okay. I, I've discovered something about this property that raises a lot of questions about what you're trying to do to them. Oh, okay. And then that's the west side parcel. The east side parcels are over here. It's the tag end is 30, uh, the end of the parcel number is 38. For this one, that's a 20-acre parcel. This is a 30... Uh, a four acre parcel, the one that ends in 36. These others are in SIDs. And this is what was there in the summertime. No harm, no foul. Nice, nice big bales of alfalfa. But this is, this is how it looks now, where it's been uh, quite severely graded. Here's a little picture. It's a little better with the light. Um, there's a gravel road and, and, uh, and a posted speed limit, and, and much of it's been much have been has been graded down and so based on what we see as a, a lack of agricultural use uh, we are seeking to disqualify the the parcel I mean at some point this thing's going to turn over um, from agricultural to development and I think I think at least based on what we've seen out there that's kind of where we are Do so with that um, I'm sure that that uh, the property owners council will have lots to say I just have one other question. So you think this is at the point where they've they've uh, started construction? That's what it look. That's what they're doing. Well, I don't think they're doing ag anymore. Is I guess the way I would okay, put it. Well, but you don't think it's not into the next class where you could re re remove the ag and now you think it's going to be it's it, it is being developed right now. Well, this is it, it's kind of a binary choice, Commissioner. Either you are getting the the special valuation preference that you get for doing agricultural purposes or you get valued at your market value. I mean, there isn't, there isn't really anything in between. So you're looking at the future? Beginning in 2020, yeah. So you're, you're trying to value it for what it's going to be, not what it is. Well, <laughs> well what we think it is is a, is a development parcel that doesn't do agriculture anymore. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Sure. Uh, this would be the opportunity to hear from the landowners or their representatives. Good morning. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the, uh, the Douglas County Board of Commissioners, uh, my name is David Carnes. Um, I represent r, r Development, which is the owner of these parcels that are the subject of this discussion. And uh, my address, uh, my office address is 1650 Farnham Street, and I'm a partner with a law firm called QTAC Rock. And I have my colleague uh, who's been helping me on this particular issue, and I'll let him introduce himself. Dwyer Arce from QTAC Rock on behalf of uh, the, uh, the taxpayer here. I apologize. I missed your first name. Dwyer. Dwyer, thank you. And um, uh, knowing that this is going to be a little confusing, um, I've asked to have a, uh, a map that we've prepared uh, outlining the different um, subdivided parcels. And if I can show you this. Uh, That's the best we can do there, Dwyer? Uh, yes. Okay. If I could, um, uh, when R&R when, uh, &R Development bought the property, 
in 2016, um, this, um, this parcel here, the entire parcel, um, had been in agriculture and had always been in agriculture. And it has continued to be all in agriculture as far as the assessment. Um, this parcel here uh, was a, a separate parcel that was likewise purchased. And um, uh, again, it's the larger parcel. The yellow parcels are the p parcels that are not in the SID. And as Mr. Goodwillie mentioned, when the notices were first sent out to us as far as disqualification of agriculture, they indicated that the basis was that this was all in an SID. The gray portions and the supporting infrastructure, which are the roads, are uh, either in the SID or they're in the supporting infrastructure that's allowed under state statute to be, to be uh, constructed to support SID development. Our request is to have those parcels that uh, um, you can, I don't, I don't know if you can see, this parcel right here is 0038, this parcel is 0036, and they, uh, they total approximately, this entire parcel totals approximately 40 acres. The part that has been placed in the SID and the supporting infrastructure and roads as allowed by Nebraska statute um, uh, totals uh, about 16 acres, and that is in the SID. Over here on the, on the west parcel, we have a total acreage of about 20 acres, <coughs> and the SID now includes about 14 acres. It's the gray area plus the supporting infrastructure. So what we are seeking is, uh, as was determined by uh, the referee last year, when we challenged this and was approved by the Board of Equalization that the parcels that are in agriculture continue to be viewed as special agriculture. And we will show you the crop that was planted in 2018 that was, um, that was uh, gr grew on that property and uh, the first cut was made by the farmer in uh, 2019 but uh, because of some of the work that had to be done in order to clear the existing structures that have been on that property, particularly on the west property, we were unable to, um, uh, the farmer, it's his decision to make, we have a farm lease with the farmer, he pays us rent, and it's his decision to make as to whether or not he believes that he can take a, a crop. And um, Mr. Goodwillie didn't, didn't show you this, but we can show you pictures of the crop that was harvested on the east side and rolled into bales and sold. Um, so what I'd like to uh, mention to you right now is a little bit of history. Um, back in 2018, um, the, uh, the assessor's office first determined that the, these two larger parcels, which had uh, always been in agriculture, no longer qualified for agriculture because they found some heavy equipment located either on the property or, or close to the property. Now I want to point out that all the other areas that are in white are properties that are owned by other developers. There's a company called Avenue One you may be familiar with. It's been down um, before the planning board quite a bit on development that's taking place all around this. So you've got to be very careful when you go out there because these are very technical meets and bounds uh, descriptions that um, you get pictures of the parcels that are included in those areas that we consider to be continuing agriculture. So the, um, um, the first item I'd like to mention back in 2018, <clears throat> we um, bought the parcel here on the, on the west side. There were farm buildings and a home and uh, supporting agricultural structures. And we received some concerns from some of the law enforcement folks or some of the neighbors that uh, this was becoming an attractive nuisance because um, I know it's hard to believe with our young citizenry here in this area, but they were <clears throat> being attracted to come to this property and uh, enjoy themselves. And so rather than creating a significant liability issue for our property owner in a property that had been abandoned by, after we purchased it, it was abandoned by the, by the owner of the property. We went in in December of 2017 and then continued in, in January of 2018 to, to eliminate the, the buildings, tear them all down, 
take out the, uh, the farm structures and do the best we can to allow the farmer to farm the entire parcel. So uh, we did that. And uh, in the notice we got from, uh, from the assessor's office back in December of 2017, they indicated that um, we have seen heavy equipment on the property and so we believe that um, uh, that's no longer ag because it looks like something is going to happen significant as far as development. Well, the story is, is that we had those properties that needed to be demolished. The abandoned properties need to be uh, eliminated. And there was a large cell tower that we no longer had any interest in uh, was uh, later on that year removed and it was a significant construction project that the cell company uh, took upon itself to do. In, in 2018, we entered into a lease with uh, the farmer where we said we are going to remove buildings and structures on the property in order to prepare the entire parcel for development purposes, for agri special agricultural development, and continue what had always been the case. And we entered into the lease with the farmer, and we said, we will be planting alfalfa, which is, for some of you may know, it's a perennial crop. It can be planted in the spring or the fall. And the farmer and, uh, and us agreed that we needed to do some land preparation and some site clearance. And in order to complete that during a period of time when the ground wasn't frozen or it wasn't underwater, um, during that uh, summer, it was a very wet summer, we um, uh, agreed, mutually agreed with the farmer and we have a lease to that effect, that alfalfa would be planted in the fall. And it was planted in the fall. And uh, I will show you pictures of uh, the crop that was growing um, uh, in, the, in the spring the following year, right before that first cutting uh, was made by the farmer. And in 2019, we, we applied for special ag again. And um, uh, the, the um, we submitted our, our application, and uh, we were assigned to a referee by the, uh, the assessor. The ref we brought our evidence in. We had uh, drone pictures of the parcels showing the agricultural activity and the robust crop that was growing at that time. This was in uh, May and June of 2019. Uh, 2019. The, um, the referee determined very quickly uh, that this was special ag, and both, both parcels, the two larger parcels, are, are and should be deemed to be special agriculture. So in 2019, after we made our case to the referee, and then it was approved later by the assessor's office, and then this came before the Board of Equalization, you folks unanimously approved, the uh, designation of these two larger parcels as agriculture. So in the interim, what's happened is that these um, gray areas now are being developed. They were placed in an SID. And the, many of the pictures that you may see in the materials from the, uh, from the county is equipment that is there to help put in the roads and the infrastructure so that we can get to the SID property that's being developed currently. So what I'd like to do um, is, um, um, if, Dwyer, if you could put up a picture of, um, do you have anything from uh, our 2019 appeal to the, to the, uh, the county and the referee? I needed to be somebody younger along my time. <laughs> I, I assume technology. that's why Dwyer's here. Um, I would I probably show <laughs> some, show some pictures of my kids or something, so that wouldn't have helped. <coughs> So what I'm going to show you are the, uh, when we were um, asked to come and make a presentation of the referee uh, in the assessor's office, I'm going to show you some of the evidence that we presented showing that the crop that was planted in, in September of 2018 had fully matured uh, and was ready for harvest in 2019. Again, as um, was pointed out, uh, the farmer decided that there was too much debris in the soil to have a clean cut. And so he um, uh, worked the rest of the year 
and tried to clear, clean up that property. But regardless, he paid lease payments. His intention yes. was to have a uh, commercial um, harvest. And just because he didn't sell the property, there's nothing in the state statutes or anything that indicate that you have to be able to sell a, prop, sell a crop. And there's a lot of farmers around the state that put their property in, in fallow. And uh, just because they're not using it in a particular year does not mean that they've no longer decided to have it in agriculture. And basically that's what this farmer decided. He'd rather clean the property a bit more and be able to secure a crop. So, um, okay, Dwyer, I don't know. These are pictures, right? These are the June Okay, this is the, uh, the parcel on the, um, well, it's a parcel on the west. It's a six, a little over six acre parcel um, well, it's a, it was at that time a 20-acre parcel, and uh, we have drone pictures, and these are what we presented to the, um, to the referee, and they determined that the property on the west clearly is in agriculture. And this, these pictures were taken in May and June of um, 2019. So now, as I mentioned earlier, um, other than six acres on this parcel, the rest is now being developed and it's in an SID, and of course, it, once it's in an SID, it no longer qualifies for um, special ag. So all we're asking for is this, the six acres that uh, remain in agricultural on this property that has not changed its use be continued to be considered special agriculture. And um, let me show you, um, if I could, yeah. Um, why don't you do this one? Are. I'm going to ask that we kind of bring this to its conclusion okay. soon if we could. Okay. okay. Well, um, here's, here's a picture of the crop, and Dwyer, if you can put that on there, here's a picture of the, of the alfalfa. Alfalfa is a perennial crop, and so it's, it's cut, but it's not uh, completely harvested like corn or beans. So here's a picture of, uh, this was taken two days ago, of the, uh, of the um, alfalfa that is in, um, in a dormant situation. We're waiting for the spring to have a, another cut done and the farmer done. So that's basically, um, Mr. Chairman, what, um, what we were talking about. I would like to, can you show me um, very quickly um, your decision? No, that's just more of the same, showing uh, the dormant um, alfalfa that was out there two days ago. And um, here is what you folks decided last year in August, stating that the parcel qualifies for special use green belt uh, application. And that was a similar decision was made on both par parcels. And um, in the decision the Board of Equalization sent uh, on, on August 20th, they said uh, on Tuesday, August 20th, the Board of Equalization approved the corrections to clerical errors and other erroneous assessments you know, made by the county assessor, and you are now awarded special ag on a continuing basis. So the parcel on the east um, has always been in agriculture, special ag. Now it's been subdivided, and there's some development taking place. On the west, that parcel now is only six acres that we're seeking to have continuing agriculture. So out of the total of, um, of 60 acres on both east and west sides, we are asking um, for... Um, uh, only 30 acres of those 60 acres are in an SID, and no longer, we're not challenging those. So lastly, let me um, draw a, a bit of a conclusion here. Um, the statute itself in Nebraska um, states that whether a parcel of land is primarily used for agricultural or horticultural purposes shall be determined without regard to whether some or all the parcel is platted, subdivided, into separate lots or developed with improvements consisting of streets, sidewalks, curbs, gutters, sewer lines, water lines, or utility lines. The question is, what's the overall use of the property? So there is activity out there. The pictures they, they took, there's, it's hard to determine if those are pictures of, proper, of, of equipment and things that were on the property or not. But even if it was on the property, the point is the remaining parcels that we're seeking to be special ag, um, about 30 acres, uh, will, um, will be developed at some point in time, but they will not be developed this year. And we have another lease agreement with a farmer that he will be farming those remaining 30 acres this year. 
And as you can see, the residual of the alfalfa as of January 1st, because the state statute says you determine the use if you best can as of the January 1st, you can see the residue uh, here of the alfalfa that was uh, cut once and uh, the farmer plans to do another cutting in the spring. So as of January 1st, this property that we're asking for, not the entire parcels, not the old larger 60 acres, some of which is now SID and being developed, um, this is what uh, you will find if you drive out there and take a look at what's growing on the property currently. So we would ask respectively the <coughs> county commissioners to, to do what you did last year and approve um, this limited amount of property for continuing special ag valuation. Thank you, Dave Dwyer. We do have a couple of questions from commissioners, starting with Commissioner Kavanaugh. Thank you. Thanks for this. So I'm looking at these two exhibits that we were provided for identified by Mr. Yep. Goodwillie's office. <clears throat> and just trying to get a, a geographical sense of what we're talking about here. Do these two parcels represent the entire 60 acres that you referenced? Um, Oh, Mr. Goodwill are those the east and west parcels? Yeah, yeah those, those, the, the pictures of the overheads, Commissioner, Yes. with the subdivision, the different These guys. parcel lines on right, it, right. that's the entire 60. The one you have in your right. right hand, I think, is the west side parcel, although it flips around. Oh, and I, I think, thought I had it the other way. No, no, I, no, I'm sorry, the one, this is the right, east. Your, right, the, the, your right hand, I think, is the west side parcel. The, uh, your left hand is the east side parcel. Oh, the east side I thought I had it the other way. In any event, you had one with both parcels pictured. If we could bring that up again for discussion purposes. Commissioner Cavanaugh, if you would, what you have is the overhead version uh -huh. of, of the map yeah. that these folks have, have put on. Mm -hmm. right. so, so this is the west side parcel. This one here. Oh, I'm sorry, it's not. There we go. Okay. So, so this one here is the west side parcel and the gotcha. east side parcel. Right. So, and Mr. Goodwillie, I'm going to ask you in a second something here. But, uh, Mr. Carnes, on this map, this is the entire 60 acres in yellow. Is that correct? No, it's in the gray. Uh, everything inside those gray everything and yellow. Everything in the larger boundary right here, right okay. there. Okay. So is in those two squares rectangles are the entire 60 acres, correct. correct? Okay. Now, of that 60 acre plot, what 30 acres are you are you saying are still in ag? Those are the yellow the yellow parcels. The One yellow on the parcels on both spots. Okay. Yeah. And the gray would be under development or anticipated. Those are for in SIDs and SID no development. Eligible. As I read this, there are there's Fountain 2 LLC and there is Fountain West Office Park LLC, presumably related. Do you represent both entities? That's correct. Okay. And there are two items on your agenda, and we're kind of combining one and two. I understand, but they involve the same area of land. Is That's that correct? correct? Okay. So in the gray areas, there is an SID that's going to do some residential development, or what so is it's commercial development, office okay. buildings. Both of them are commercial developments. Right. Yeah. Okay. The rest, the yellow area, is alfalfa fields. Correct. Okay. And those were planted in 2018, in uh, September of 2000, or August, September 2018. And I, I think the affidavit represents uh, someone who leases that for purposes of harvesting the, the alfalfa, yeah. right? The, the farm lease uh, from last year, which went up, ran up to December 31st, is, right. uh, is the same farmer will be having farmed that remaining 30 acres this right. year. And if I recall correctly, when you were before us before, one of the questions was, is there a lease for the agricultural produce of this property? And now there is, right? That's not a question anymore. That's correct. Okay. And this lease or harvested the alfalfa but did not remove it from the field. Right, but he paid the rent. So he paid the rent. Yeah, but uh, that was what for whatever doing. reason, he didn't uh, remove the crop from the the field. Uh, and I don't want to get into why that was, but I think that you make a point that the statute doesn't require you to remove the crop from the field. No, no. And it appears that there may have been some 
problems in accessing the crop for removal from the field. I did a little bit of alfalfa harvesting when I was a young man, and I understand how you have to get in and out and move yeah. things around. But, Mr. Goodwillie, is it the position of your office that because it was not removed that it is not in agricultural production? Uh, yeah, our view is commercial production contemplates uh, doing activities to attempt to make a profit. So we've had a record year of flooding in the western portion of our agricultural producing county. And those fields It was that, wet on the east, too, for what it's worth. And, and a farm <laughs> over on the east that somebody might know something about. Okay. Those entities haven't been able to take a crop out of their fields this year. Are they subject to the same kind of, we're going to pull your ag designation? I, I think the difference is in the circumstances. I, I'm sorry. I think the differences are all about the circumstances. They weren't able to take a crop here, not because of flooding or because of some sort of agricultural blight. They were not able to take it because when the property was graded, all sorts of debris was pushed around that made it hard for the farmer to do his, his cropping. And while uh, there may be some law enforcement influence in knocking those things down, I'm not going to argue that, but they were going to have to grade it to develop it anyway. And so in the end, what you've got is a situation where the property owner can't harvest because of the work they did to grade in preparation for development. Yeah, and, I, in I, fact, I, and in fact, in the farmer's affidavit that's included, you know, they hope to have a crop in 19 and didn't. Right. Now they hope to have a crop in 2020. Right. I don't know if we're going to have a crop in 2020. Right. And all these, you know, flood-related uh, areas of western Douglas County and eastern Douglas County, um, are in the, the same situation. They don't know if they'll have a, they didn't have a crop in, in 19. They don't know if they'll have a crop in uh, 20. I, my point is, I don't know that motivation for having your crop removed or not having your crop removed is an element of the designation, is it? Motivation of what you do with your crop, is that part of the determination? It isn't necessarily part of the determination, but Certainly, if, if you have to grade it and you do grade it in preparation for development, that has an impact on what you're doing with the property. No, I think there's a considerable distinction between not being able to take a crop because of an act of God, a flood, and because, you know, you, were, you did not remove, or the developer did not remove the necessary, uh, all of the debris, so that you could have one. I think that's a considerable well, difference. Well, I understand, but I, that's not an element of the law as I understand it. it well, the element of the law is you have to primarily use your property <coughs> for agricultural purposes, which right. contemplates commercial production, which contemplates selling something. But if for whatever reason, act of God, act of nature, whatever, call it what you will, Well, act of you developer can't, in this case. It doesn't seem to be used in other contexts to disqualify people from this designation. My point is, they seem to have bifurcated the property between what's clearly going to be developed into a commercial SID development and what clearly is in an alfalfa field. And then they've cut it in half, have they not? They have cut it in half, and there is alfalfa on the west side parcel. The east side parcel, much of that has been bulldozed. I understand. And uh, Mr. Carnes, isn't that in fact what your uh, client is doing? He's developing part of it for commercial right. real estate? and. Part it's of like everybody does in this area, you know, the statute is very clear that the value uh, that's, that's uh, required by the assessor is not what it could be down the road, it's uh -huh. what it currently is at right. that time. And they're even allowing in the statute in the sections that I read to you that there can be some improvements made, particularly if you're accessing some of the SID property that's currently under development. And you're not asking for preservation of the ag designation of the SID property simply for the Correct. ag prop, right. uh, the alfalfa Correct. property. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, okay, Mr. Carnes, this is, this is what I get out of this. 2016, you bought the property. 2018, the assessor um, took the green belt status away. That decision is in Turk right now. Correct. But in 19, you went through the same process. I guess the question is, in 18, did the board approve this and the, the assess? Well, let me, let, me, let me keep on this track. In 19, 
went through the process. The board approved it. And what you're asking for, and at some point here, after the year is over, December 31st, 2019, the assessor goes back and makes a correction and deems it not after the board did. And so, and you'll help me out on this. And it sounds like what you're saying is, because the board approved it, it shouldn't go back and be repealed even after evidence is kind of questioned, even though with Commissioner Kavanaugh's point, the area is kind of gray, it's hard to believe there's a lot of forming because of piping and other stuff like that. So basically it seems like you're asking, keep it like it was designated right now until the development happens. And then when the development happens, then you can fully tax it. Yeah. Is, that a, is that an assumption? On 30 acres, it's in 30 acres and supporting roads are in the SID. Those are not, not challenged. You know, what we are ch challenging is that the remaining property that is in continuing ag use because of the growth that we have in, in the alfalfa that was planted back in 18, and we showed pictures of it, uh, that uh, is the only parcel that we're seeking to have continuing ag valuation. And you all don't dispute that there's development. The point, it sounds like the point is, after December 31st, 2019, this shouldn't be eligible to be changed. Well, we'd like to have it continue to what you just, you folks decided last year. Okay. Uh, if if I'm, portion of it. I'm sorry. Yeah. If I may help from a process standpoint, yeah. what state law says about special valuation is once, once you have it for a year, you, you have it. So even if the use changes or you become part of an SID or you get annexed by a city, you get to keep that value for the remainder of the tax year. What happens when a property becomes disqualified is beginning the next year, the property is valued at its non-agricultural market value. So from a process standpoint, we viewed the use of the property as, as no longer qualifying. That's why we sent the letter out in December of 2019. So this isn't going to affect the 2019 tax bill. What it would potentially affect is the 2020 value of these three parts. So the the 2019 bill is based off 2018, which they are protesting. No, they they reapplied on the west side par, uh, on the west side parcel. They reapplied for special valuation in 2019, okay. and because they came in and in, in in late 2018, and they planted something, and we saw something growing out there in June. Yeah, we 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 granted it because each year stands on its own. Okay, the, my question though is when is the year? Because if they came in in 19. Sure. We granted it. Whatever that value is takes effect now, right? They that, have, that's what they're, they're going to pay. They were billed in December 2019 right. for a value representing their special agricultural value. And if that value would have stood... It's, that it stands. It's a done deal. What we're talking about is does the property no longer qualify and does it get a market value in 2020? Oh, okay. Okay, Got does that it. make sense? Got Some it. years ago, and okay. I'm going to do a history lesson, I, uh, you know, I think uh, Senator Carnes and I are from the same generation where we stink at technology, but we remember stuff from the olden days, and in the olden <laughs> days, and, and, and what's that? The olden days, right. Well, the, the olden days, uh, it used to be when property would disqualify from agricultural purposes, there'd be something called recapture. And so we used to keep two sets of two sets of values one market value and one special value and if the property was disqualified during the year then it would trigger uh current year and the previous three worth of taxes on the difference between the ag value and the market value um some years ago uh god's probably seven or eight which seems like the olden days to me anyway uh that changed and so now once you're in it as these folks were in 2019, they keep that value and they get taxed on that basis. But so, a, a mid-year disqualification means the next year they get market value. Okay, so now with that time, okay, so I'm lost while, while we're here today because you'll get a <laughs> shot in June to correct this. So is this an early shot across the bow between the protest period in January and March that's by state law? 
well we can't if we don't do something before the end of a particular tax year then the property will continue to carry its special valuation status into the net so if if you think the property is no longer being used for agricultural purposes and you want to value that property at its actual or market value reflecting its 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 use and its true value out in the marketplace you sort of have to disqualify in year a to be able to value that way in year b so basically you're going through a process if so, we decide so if we, to did, if we decide this, to deny it they still have a shot at it in june that's the way we've always viewed it okay thank you thank you i'm going to ask that we we still got a few more commissioners wanting to speak but i'd like to kind of bring this to a conclusion as soon as we can Having said that, <laughs> Commissioner Morgan. Okay, it'll be quick. I'm kind of leaning toward what you said, but fortunately, uh, I'm not the brightest person for sure on this <laughs> board. And we have a chairman that happens to be in the farming business. <laughs> so I would like to hear your comments as to how you see this, because you've talked a lot about the green belt and that kind of thing over my years here. So go ahead and give me well, your well, thank you for that, Commissioner Morgan. Um, I think what happened to the hay is kind of a moot point. Uh, doesn't matter if being hay, uh, an agricultural use. If your hay gets rained on while it's curing, you got to throw it away. But you still have to bale it and burn it or whatever. You got to get it off the field. If you are doing demolition, if you're removing an old home site, yeah, there's going to be inevitably debris in your hay that may be enough to make it not. Uh, viable uh, as an animal product, but it still is farming. The only crop I got planted this year was cover crop, 340 acres of cover crop that then flooded out. I had no product to sell. We're, we're selling dead timber. That's the only product we have to sell off of our farm. But it is still a farm, and I believe that this still, in my mind, is being farmed and, and looks to me as if it should qualify. And that would be the part that's not in the SID. Correct, of course. Yes. Okay. Yes. I just wanted to have you, and I appreciate that. The demand for alfalfa is real high right now because of the flooding. My sister paid $11 a bale for little bales uh, last fall, and it's almost impossible to even find right now. There are so many people that have no hay impacted by the flooding. The demand is strong. If that hay were of good enough quality, there would be huge demand for it. I've been buying a lot. We had to start feeding hay this summer because of the flooding. And so the demand for hay is huge right now, and the supply is limited of good hay. But then I don't wish to get off into farming. OK. <laughs> Thank Commissioner you. Boyle? Well, I, I think you've really uh, answered a lot of questions, and you've really hit the nail on the head. Uh, I, I will only say that I, I just don't, I think one of the things that uh, someone said here about uh, land that uh, is not farmed uh, doesn't use its uh, for whatever reason, doesn't you lose its status. And that's where we are here. I just think we're jumping the gun. There'll be time for this, this new assessment to come on. I, I don't think that it's timely to assess you for what you're going to do. I think, you know, that tearing down the farmhouse, uh, as Commissioner Duda said so well as a farmer, and I do respect that greatly, my family uh, homesteaded in Saunders County, and they're farmers too, believe it or not. Nice. We're all tied to it. So, I mean, I really, I think you hit the nail on the head, Claire, and I see no point in uh, making any further statements. I think you've already said it all um, about what happens on a farm and, and how it's handled. So I'll, I'll uh, speak no more. Thank you. Any, anybody else wishing to, uh, questions or comments? I, I, I would like to wrap this up, but there's also, if anybody from the public would wish to comment on this, they have that opportunity as well before we make a decision. Uh, if not, Uh, Senator Carnes and uh, the QTEC law firm representing R&R uh, &R development of the relief they seek. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. And further? Yeah, clarifications. We're talking both items, yes. E and F. Yes. Not further clarification. <laughs> they submitted a total of five protests. Item E is one protest. Item F is actually four, two for each parcel. So if I may, if the motion is seconded, agree, we dismiss the protest based on the SID annexation, but grant the applicants their requested relief for the protest based on agricultural use. Fine. Uh, and the SID. right, the SID, everybody agrees the SID land is right. It's off. the 30 acres that's being used for agricultural purposes that we just, that's 
that we authorize the designation to continue. But I got sorry because we got to send notices out. I just want to make sure no straight. They, You're fine. Then. No they problem. requested, in addition to having the, you know, they have specific valuations they were requesting based on receiving the special valuations. Are we granting those valuations they request in their protest? Don't you have a? I mean, doesn't the assessor's office have a green belt value for them? Excuse me. Well, the, the valuation piece for 2020 is a little premature. I mean, All right. these folks have already been taxed for 2019 on okay. their special value. Right now, values are in a preliminary state. They won't be final in our shop okay. until the, the middle of March. Uh, but nonetheless, if you, if you grant the protest today, then we will treat them as special valuation parcels for valuation purposes in 2020. Can, can, is it okay if the motion is just that, that we are granting the green belt uh, for these parcels? Well, I would think it would be premature to deal with the 2020 valuation issues right. Right. since they're not even final. So all we're addressing is whether or not it's green belted, period. That would be the way I would read it, but, yeah. but perhaps... Uh, uh, yeah. That sounds like the like cleanest way to move forward with that, sorry. Mr. Chairman, that's correct. All right, right. Are, you, are you okay with that? Yeah, this is a question of status, not valuation. Right. Correct, correct, very good. And the, and the parcels are different. You know, we're asking for, in 19, all those 60 acres were included. In, in 20, their office is going to have to determine only the 30 acres right. that we allege is agriculture. So 30 acres is going to be up to them as far as what they determine uh, to be um, non-special Very good. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, finally, I would all like right. to <laughs> <laughs> bring this to a vote. Much. We won't bring any more ag issues before you. Have, it, so. It's a deal. Of course, you haven't seen how we voted yet either. Uh, and I, I'm sorry. When, uh, Commissioner Boyle made the motion, and Commissioner Cavanaugh seconded. Correct. 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 Okay. All right. We are ready when you all are. Yes. Okay. Uh, motion passes. Uh, Commissioner Kraft abstains. All our commissioners voting yes. Oh. I need to read during part of their argument. Oh, okay. That's discussion. So hence I the abstention. Yes. Very good. Thank you. I, I don't feel I was fully informed because I needed to leave the room. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Kraft. Um, I am not aware of need for exec session for the Board of Equalization. I sure hope not. Um, I have a motion to adjourn. Second. Um, and I'm just going to we got it. Yeah. adjourn. All right. Uh, with the motion made, we don't have to vote on that. Okay, we will now uh, convene as the Board of Commissioners. Could we please have the roll call for that? Commissioner Borgeson is absent. Commissioner Boyle? Here. Commissioner Cavanaugh? Here. Commissioner Duda? Here. Commissioner Kraft? Yeah. Commissioner Morgan? Here. Commissioner Rogers? Here. Uh, the first item for consideration is 1A and B, minutes from the meeting last week and claims for payment through today's date. Motion on the second. Uh, questions or comments? Could we please vote? Motion passes six to zero. Okay, now I'm going to uh, exercise the chair's prerogative a little bit and, and do some rearranging of the agenda, if I may. Commissioner Boyle asked if we could get to his item uh, quickly out of respect for some people that, that are here to address it and uh, what, I, I'm sorry what's the number of that because I'm happy to uh, 7g3 on page 6 okay thank you so I would like to go directly to that and then we will do our presentations and then we'll come back to the consent agenda thank you very much, Mr. so with that I turn the floor yep. over to you Commissioner Boyle uh, I'm going to speak very briefly uh, because I do want uh, in spite of what it appears, I do want a robust public discussion. The reason I put this on the agenda is that uh, I feel uh, that we are uh, not treating uh, the citizens who step up uh, with respect when they make comments about uh, what we do and what we don't do, what we uh, are uh, congratulated on and what we're criticized for. Uh, my feeling is that we owe the citizens of this community complete transparency, honesty, and uh, uh, full uh, discussion of uh, what we do and why we do it. So because of that, uh, I've been frustrated by a system that uh, tells us that uh, you can uh, speak to us and we are gagged. 
it's a gag order uh, that we're not allowed to speak, and it's gotten pretty extreme. As I mentioned, I approached the uh, podium uh, a few weeks ago to try to respond to a, a, a citizen's comments and be respectful, and I was uh, told I was out of order, and uh, so I had to come back and take my seat, and my comments were not heard. So with that, uh, I would like to ask the chair to uh, open the uh, hearing, if he would, and uh, uh, ask the citizens to come up and tell us what we can do uh, to become responsive to you uh, when you make comments to us. Uh, what can we do? Should we have a special item on the agenda? Should we figure out how to do that? What can we do to answer your questions and criticisms? Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Good Chair, morning. If, I, if I may, Mr. Clerk. just wanted to clarify for anyone from the public might be commenting, please give us uh, your full name, or well, your first and last name. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for that reminder. My name is LaVon Dennis Williams, 1941 South 42nd Street, Suite uh, 502, Omaha, Nebraska. I'm speaking in opposition to the resolution. Um, I thank you, uh, Mayor Boyle, Commissioner Boyle, for uh, putting the context into why you came forward with that uh, resolution. That definitely uh, helped me because I knew that as a mayor, you were one of the most transparent people we've ever had govern the city. Um, but I, I, t I tell you that I don't think you guys want to model yourself behind the city council or the legislature that shuts the people out. Uh, Commissioner Kavanaugh, one of the things your brother once always said, government works best when you allow the people in. And I think that that conversation that allowing people to come in is important to what you're doing. Um, if you are concerned about uh, AG's opinion that says you cannot respond, the way to correct that then is to take the comments that people are bringing forth to you and then put them on the agenda for the following week. Because I think it's important that you have to admit you all cannot be everywhere all the time. You do not know all the things that are impacting the people whom you are elected to serve. Sometime that comes from those of us who are in the community, who are closer to the problem, who will bring matters right. to you that need to be addressed. So the way to correct that if you cannot have public input is to use that period, don't get rid of it, use it as an opportunity to gain information from your constituents and then add that to your agenda because I tell you right now, I've tried several times to get items added to the agenda and it's not possible. So you're going to have to have some way to allow people that you are elected to represent to be able to bring matters to your attention and discuss issues that may not always appear on the agenda. Okay. Um, and so I thank you for this time to speak. I probably will not be here for the um, portion regarding the resolutions, but I would also like to remind this commission body that February is not just Heart Health right. Month, it's Black History Month. Yes, it is. And this county is 166 years and we're still making history. Yep. Um, and so I think that you all would be remiss if you did not also recognize that this is Black History Month. And for those of us who work in juvenile justice, this is also uh, Dating Violence Awareness Month for teens. And it's Cancer Prevention Awareness yeah. Month. So I hope that you would all embrace those as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank for you, your Ms. Comments Thank you very much. May, may I ask quickly, uh, how many people wish to address this? If this is going to be a big item, yeah. with apologies. Well, there's not that many. There's five. Well, we've got some people from the Heart Association that oh, are yeah. waiting, and I don't want to wait them. They, they, they learned a whole lot more about Greenbelt today than they had any intention of we learning. Get through this quickly, though. Well, do you think we can? I don't think we we're can. going to. We can. Uh, It'll just take 15 or 20 minutes, I think. Okay, if we can move it quick, I want to give it the time people want. I don't want to rush it. Uh, but I also, if we're going to be an hour on this topic, I would like to uh, we'll see you have turn to the, okay, Thank very good. All right, um, use please use the timer. And I am going to ask people, I, frankly, I'm not even sure this is going to come to a vote. I don't think we need to waste too much time on this item uh, for what it's worth. So, thanks. Doug. Good morning. Doug morning. Kagan, 416 South 130th Street, representing Nebraska Taxpayers for Freedom. As we did last year, once again, we are requesting this board to preserve public comment time on items not listed on your agenda. Currently, the Nebraska Open Meetings Act requires local subdivisions like this one to provide time for public commentary at some but not all meetings. Generously, this board historically has allowed such commentary at every public meeting notwithstanding the fact that individuals sometimes will speak on extraneous topics not germane to the board agenda. 
speak and act in an unseemly or insulting manner or not able to abide by the time limit or other rules. Yet, as public officials, you also are public servants, and therefore, in serving your constituents, must brace yourselves to endure public comments that you believe of no value whatsoever. Not only in this venue, but throughout the state, some public officials seek to muzzle public input by tightening restrictions on public comment at their meetings for one reason or another. This growing problem has resulted in a pending bill in the legislature, which I refer to below, to amend the Open Meetings Act to require all local subdivisions to allow the public the right to speak at all meetings, but still permit such bodies to utilize reasonable rules for speaker conduct. Our MTF group would be willing to cooperate with the board to implement such rules or work even with the Attorney General's office Great. to change things. We plan to testify in favor of this bill in order to preserve our First Amendment rights to express our views publicly. Meanwhile, we urge county commissioners to vote no on this resolution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doug. Uh, it has been brought to my attention that this is actually listed as a discussion item today, so there will be no vote today regardless. It's not on the agenda for a vote. This is simply a discussion item. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you very much. Gina Miller, thank you, Commissioners. Um, thank you, uh, Commissioner Boyle, for uh, bringing this up. Um, it was very confusing to me that you were the sponsor sorry, of this. Gina Miller, yes, um, that you were the sponsor of this as resolution because I think our history has been that you have been the most engaging um, and uh, of the com not of the commissioners, <laughs> but you've always opened Cor yourself <laughs> to be very engaging with the public. So I really appreciate that. Um, you, it is a very, very frustrating um, issue as a citizen to deal with on all the boards across the state. So um, as many of you know, I am pretty active and try and stay engaged. I actually took work off this morning to come talk on this because it is so important to me about public comment. Um, I did the same thing when OPS tried to um, uh, limit public comment. Um, they tried to reduce the time of comment. I missed my uh, my daughter's freshman oh. uh, parent teachers conferences for that. Um, OIS had a sim similar uh, situation, and I missed something big that morning. So this is really important to the public. So by the time I get back to work, I will be short about two hundred dollars today oh. between parking mileage um, and my time out of office today. So just so you can kind of understand the passion that's around this issue, um, I think most of us that are speaking today are very active. Every board does something a little bit different. Um, I appreciate any opportunity for public comment. My issue here is if we would to eliminate public comment and only push it to the back end of each individual I issue, today I would not be able to stay that long. There's just no way. I have to be able to do my public comment at the front of most meetings. If I can, it's my desire to stay for an entire meeting so that I can understand the full scope of things. I know that OPS has been trying to work with the citizens of they have representatives that they will come down and talk to us afterwards if it's something very you know, important that they feel that the individual needs some recognition or some some discussion right away. They'll say, hey, can somebody go and talk to that person? Most places I have to sign in with all my contact information so, so um, the board can get back to me if they have specific information or that if they're going to put it on another agenda item. There are many ways to do this. I would hate to lose the front end public comment. You can't lose a public comment at all, um, but not to have the front end public comment is really, really difficult, especially for boards that only meet during the day, especially for individuals at work. So thank you very much for your intentions. Well, I'm sorry to drag you out. I apologize. <laughs> it's important. Thank you. thank you. It is. Thank you for taking the time to thank come to share with us this Norton. morning. Anybody else? Good morning. Good morning. I'll try to keep my comments short. Susan Gum. Currently, citizens' comments guarantees every citizen his or her right to speak on any topic that is not on the agenda. Being able to request that an item be placed on the agenda does not guarantee that the item will be placed on the agenda. The right to speak will be at the discretion of the board members who will determine which items are placed on the agenda. 
it is important to be able to come and express opposition to an action that has already been taken by the board. Silence is consent. If citizens don't come and speak in opposition to the action, consent is implied. Without citizens' comments, the only means of stating opposition would be to submit an agenda item request, hoping to get an opportunity to speak at a future meeting. Citizens' comments gives everyone opportunity to share information, share personal experiences, or simply give personal opinions on the issues that are important to them. Removing citizen, citizens' comments will restrict citizens' ability to speak. I hope you, you will reconsider removing citizens' comments from the board's agenda. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Susan. Susan. Anybody else? This is, well, they're coming down her comment, silence is consent. That's a double-edged sword because that's what we're feeling as well. Right. When we sit here in silence listening to people, we're afraid that it looks like we agree, we're in consent, and we just aren't allowed to respond until a week later. Part of the frustration here. Good morning, Larry. Good morning. Good morning. Larry Storer, 5015 Lafayette Avenue, Omaha, 68132. I was out of the room for a moment, so I understand that this is the time for public comments. Well, since it's not on the agenda, I'm going to bring up refugee settlement from last No, week. no, no. We're talking about something on the agenda right now, Larry. It's on the agenda. I thought we weren't supposed to talk on the agenda. Number three. Larry, you're the only one that the doesn't rules get haven't it. been changed on the printer. No, but you anyway, can. Okay, I'll get to that then. I'll All get right, to that. fine. I want to thank Kavanaugh, Commissioner Kavanaugh, and Commissioner Boyle for helping to bring this to the forefront. And it's very obvious from your objection to these discussions that there's only two on this board that are for oh, citizen Larry, comments. Oh, don't go there. Well, that's, I was you're, a little you're bit completely up, wrong. Just, you're not supposed to debate back and forth with me. <laughs> now so. we can. We're, this, uh, this is an agenda I item. Left last week, I left last week. I was a little bit mad at you, sir. I'll bet you were. Uh -huh. But I got to thinking about it. This is the only way that those two have had any input in this body is by forcing it to an issue. And I want to thank you for that. I happen to be, I consider a conservative Republican. I know you're both Democrats. But I also think that there are some so-called conservatives out there that are working against us. So I tend to go on your side here. And like Mr. Kagan said, we have to even go to the state legislature on this. If you read the Open Meetings Act, which, by the way, you have it over there where none of us care to go look at it because you're on the camera if you do. But if you read the intent of the Open Meetings Act, it's not for you. Mary Ann's not here today, but I will comment that she'd happen to be maybe past president of a national association of local governments. And they were probably discussing some of these issues in their local body association of body groups, politicians, that we don't have any input yet. But Bellevue tried to do this. How many local governments actually discussed this at their Saturday breakfast or whatever that I've heard Mr. Duda talk about? That we're going to meet with the legislatures. Who's paying for that breakfast? Have you discussed these things? Have you let the refugee people and the county board or county association officials tell you what to talk about during citizen comments or how to get around citizen comments? I think that's probably the case. If you follow everything nationally that I do, the evidence is kind of right here. This is county government. I have another one this full of city government and associations of counties and associations of cities and associations of governors. Yeah, that's the reaction we get all the time up here. And we're tired of it. Our Constitution doesn't say you're allowed to do that. You cannot supersede our Constitution. So quit trying. Thank you. Thank you. I, you know, Commissioner Boyle, you're the one that puts this on the agenda. Yep. Now, we're getting blamed for trying to suppress public comment. I, I am really sorry at the absolute distortions that are going on here. Yep. 
Nobody has expressed one word of support for suppressing public comments. Commissioner Boyle wanted to have a discussion on it. Please don't jump to the conclusion from that that we want this. Mr. Nobody Agent. has said we want this. All of these press releases and statements from the executive office of the White House you're saying are distortions? No. Last that, week, that has last week to it do was insinuated that I was a liar, that no. Ms. Gum was a liar, and this has been done before. Larry. You refer to us as disingenuous. Larry, we then you interrupt us and have us escorted out. Thank you. Larry, I, I want you to come to these meetings, and we've talked out of the meetings, and uh, what Commissioner uh, Duda is saying is that it does sound like, you know, and I, and I, I really feel uh, a lot of guilt about putting this on the agenda because I don't support <clears throat> stifling public comment, but I needed to get a feel and needed to have you folks come and support the conversations that need to be had. And it's interesting, Commissioner Duda said, silence is consent. That's how we feel when, uh, in open discussion, when you come, I can't talk to you. That's not fair, because I want to have a conversation. And, and we could, we've had conversations outside of here, but this is on Cox, and when people hear this, and uh, that's the reason. It's, it's for more free speech, not less. May I point out one more sure. fact? You From bet. the Open Meetings Act itself, excuse me, the summary of it, Posted on the Nebraska State Government website. If you don't raise an objection, and I don't raise an objection on the day that it happens, you have no standing to go to the state on a lawsuit under the Open Meetings Act. Read it. Thanks, Larry. Thank you. Commissioner Just Morgan. a quick comment so that we get it straight for the maybe hundredth time. If an item's on the agenda, Anyone can come up and talk, and we can respond. Yeah. All of us are for continuing to let the citizens speak right. on any subject they want to, whether it's a city issue, a world issue, whatever. However, as Commissioner Boyle said, and you correct me, we are not to respond, and sometimes we'd like to respond right. to that, but because it's not on the agenda, we're not supposed to respond, and your statement is we look a little foolish because we can't answer on that. But this item is on the agenda. That's why we're responding. And for some reason, Larry, you think that if an item's on the agenda, you can't come down. You can always come down. And I have strong feelings about being respectful of the public, having them speak up on any matter even if we disagree and listening and doing the best we can then to make a decision it's a privilege to serve and all of us recognize that thank Go you ahead. although Sorry. well before we do i have one more uh, commissioner cavanaugh wished to thank you say something as well as you can see from this morning's discussion there are no rules here the rules are totally <laughs> subjective they are ignored if the chair wants to ignore them they are invoked if the chair wants to invoke them you can talk if the chair feels that you're his pal and you can talk and you can't talk if you can't you can talk about things on the agenda if we want to talk about an agenda and you can talk things not on the agenda if we want you to talk about not on the agenda or vice versa all the time uh, the american civil liberties union has submitted a letter which i want to make part of this record regarding this proposal of, of Commissioner Boyles to further muzzle the public's input into this, and they conclude in opposition to this whole resolution. Finally, we note that the timing of this resolution is concerning. Recently, the public has been particularly engaged with significant policy issues pending before the body, including specifically juvenile justice issues. A new policy limiting free speech in the midst of a content, uh, contentious debate may appear to be, to be viewpoint discrimination. The past practice of accepting citizens' comments has been working well. As such, we urge you to reject this resolution once again, because this is the same resolution that Commissioner Boyle brought to us um, some months ago, uh, once again, and retain the tradition of open government in Douglas County. The overwhelming support for rejecting this amendment should be apparent to everybody. Certainly everybody on this board has received 
not only this communication from the Civil Liberties Union, but multiple communications from citizens regarding this further attempt to muzzle your right to exercise your constitutionally guaranteed free speech in front of this public board. We're supposed to work for you. We're supposed to listen to you. We're not supposed to tell you to shut up and sit down. That's what this is about. And going forward, hopefully, we will get to the day when we have actual real rules that are invoked objectively all the time and not this made up ad hoc as we go. We like you. We don't like you. We like what you say. You can talk. We don't like what you say. You can't talk. I may not agree with what you say, but I will defend your right to say it to the end. And that's what America is all about. That's what this discussion is all about. This resolution should be pulled and not submitted again as it was you know, just recently. And we should allow you to speak to us on the agenda, off the agenda. This resolution misspeaks the reality of getting things on the agenda by saying county board members will have the discretion to put things on the agenda. No, we don't. The discretion is entirely the chairs. Chair wants something on the agenda, it goes on the agenda. It doesn't, it doesn't, period. So that's not accurate, and I think that what we should have is a fair and open discussion about having real rules, like maybe Robert's Rules of Order, that other deliberative bodies throughout the free world invoke, rather than these made-up rules, which are no rules at all. There are no rules here at the Douglas County Board. Accept that for now. We need to change that. Thank you. We're going to lose our person from the American Heart Association in three minutes. We have a survivor here who wanted to address the board, now isn't going to have time because we're too busy grandstanding over something we all are on First the Amendment same First Amendment rights, not grandstanding. It's, it's not. more important than presentations by anybody. This is a constitutional right discussion, and you don't even think that it raises the the interest of the public to hear this discussion, you want to put on a presentation, I think that's outrageous. What you're saying is absolutely outrageous. We all six agree that we want public comment. What is outrageous is the grandstanding. That's not what this, not what this resolution says. That's not what this resolution says. If you read the resolution, that's not what it says. Commissioner Boyle, I, I turn the floor back over to you. I need help. This is you out of sure control. do. Well, let me uh, let me say that uh, obviously we have a, uh, a board that active and is opinionated. That's for sure, and I, I don't mind it except that it gets a little bit off the rails. Uh, Commissioner Cavanaugh, I, I uh, did not put this on for the purpose of uh, stopping, and I did read the letter and I attempted to call the ACLU. I. I am a card-carrying member of the ACLU and have been since the 1980s, so I think most people in this audience at one time or another have said that too. Uh, I support them uh, financially and also in what they do. So uh, I did try to reach uh, the director and was unable. In any event, uh, I want you to step up and make your comments now because uh, it's time we need to get this. And I, uh, you know, I think people get the drift that I don't want stifling speech. I want to expand it, and I've got some good ideas from what you brought up today. Please, oh, oh, if, wait, wait. if I may, I'm, I'm letting commissioners speak at the moment, and Commissioner okay. Rogers oh, I'm sorry. also okay. be, before we get. And and thank you, Heart Association, and I'm so sorry that we don't have time for you. Well, if they hold. Rogers. I'm, I'm asked to make a motion to table this till after the Hearts Association presentation. And um, then once they finish, we can continue this. So basically, that's the procedure that says I'm tabling till after the discussion. If somebody seconds it I'll and approves see. it, okay. Um, and Is table the right phrase? Does that take it all? Yeah, that's together? the right phrase. No, it lays that's it over right. to later. It, it, we my specific it, motion we will bring it back is to later table today. it so until why don't we, table why don't, it until the Hearts Association presentation. Why don't, oh why don't we do this? Uh, I, I think I'm the one that put this on, and I got a good feel. Those of you who are still want to make comments, let me give you my cell phone so you can call, and I'll repeat it several times. It's 402-714-4563. 402-714-4563. Call me, and we can talk further. I'll be glad to meet you. I'll buy the coffee. Uh, I've got some great ideas from people who spoke about what needs to be done to, to allow us to not be... Uh, to be told shut up and sit down because that's what happens to us and I think we have a lot to learn from you and uh, I've learned a lot this morning and I've reinforced my views so 
I, I agree that um, I think we've got the feel, and I'm very sorry for those of you who came and, and are not able to speak here, but maybe if you want to stick around, we'll try to come back to this after the Heart Association. And I'm sorry well, I've delayed that. So. so I have comments on this motion. <sighs> Goodbye, okay. Heart Association. We're going to... You're being told to shut up and sit down by this motion we're, we're right now. Debate whether or All not of you who can. came here to speak to your public servants are being told shut up and sit down on a motion that is trying to make it permanent, shut up and sit down. No. So There's you no can't motion. talk about even your opposition to the motion Would, to shut show you me up. The motion. That's what Jim. this show me motion, the motion is about. Jim. Jim. If I can, Jim, Mr. Chair, because I, I think um, on a motion, two um, minutes. On a, yeah, a to the public, anyway. to the public, be clear. Uh, the motion to table, and it's specific, the motion to table to after the Heart Associates presentation let's the heart association present and immediately after that we come back into this so be clear that's what we're asking um you will have your chance to say that uh, your so time's just here. not that important oh to commissioner us. kavanaugh please you can wait. just wait you can just wait your time's not that important so that that's my motion yeah just let's do the heart association out of respect and then come right back to this yes okay um they even need down. to vote all right all right there's vote. no action being taken uh, on either of these items. Yep. Just have the Heart um, Association come down. So, therefore, uh, should we vote on the Heart he, Association? Well, let's, he did make a motion to table. We should vote on that All motion right. to table first. But it's only tabling for a few minutes. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Yes. Okay, okay, thank you. I vote yes. There it goes. Motion Thank you. passes five to one. Commissioner Kavanaugh voting no. Okay. Let's get the Heart Association down here and do our deal. Very good. Very good. Uh, Heart Association, are you still here? <laughs> you know more about green belt and lots of things than you had any idea this morning you'd be learning about. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for having us today. So my name is Jennifer Redman. I'm the executive director in Nebraska. Um, thank you for helping us raise awareness that it is Heart Month and having us officially kick off Heart Month. Um, at the time, I started the Heart Association 17 years ago. At the time, I didn't realize the impact that the American Heart Association had on the community um, and each and every one of us. Um, today, heart disease remains our number one killer. One in three Americans will die of heart disease. So I'm proud to work for an organization that is working to change these statistics. The American Heart Association truly saves and changes lives in our community. So I can stand here and tell you all the wonderful things we are doing, such as working with companies on their corporate wellness. We're working to fight childhood obesity in schools and, and really facing this vaping epidemic um, head on. We're providing science-based guidelines for our hospitals to ensure we are getting the best quality of care. And we are engaging community partners to help bridge a 20-year life expectancy gap in the greater Omaha area. And yes, we do all that and more, but I can't truly share any of this without sharing the stories and the reason why we do what we do and the faces behind it. And so it's my pleasure to introduce a very um, special person and a very special friend to us, um, Jenny. Jenny, could you come up and, and share your story? Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Jenny Curley, and thank you for taking the time to hear about this today. I am here on behalf of CPR, and I am here uh, because of CPR. Ten years ago, on July 12, 2010, I awoke and started gasping for breath. My husband awoke next to me, tried to wake me up, and then I stopped breathing. A quick call to a 911 telecommunicator had the person asking him a series of questions and then guiding him through CPR. They directed him to call for one of our children to help roll me over onto my back. They sent my daughter down to the front door to unlock the front door to be sure the paramedics could get in when they arrived. We were fortunate that on that ambulance that arrived, a new device, the auto pulse, was installed on this device. So in our old Dundee home, they could continue chest compressions on me while they were working their way out to the ambulance. I was shocked back into rhythm two times that morning. Wow. 10 years ago, I died and came back to life. In the intervening 10 years, I've been able to see two children graduate from college, all three graduate from high school. I've been able to attend graduations and weddings. I've been able to have conversations with friends over coffee and be at the most significant moments, including burying my father. None of those things would have happened had not my husband learned CPR in college 
And then had not the operator who answered that phone call that morning calmly walked him through the steps of CPR to guide him through the process. What I didn't know until recently is that it's not guaranteed that the person who answers the 911 dispatch call necessarily can coach the individual through CPR in every location. CPR is a lifesaver. And I'm here today to say thank you very much for declaring February Heart Month. I would encourage everyone in attendance to please learn CPR because very likely it's the person that you know and love. It's a coworker, it's a friend, it's a family member whose life you will save. Cardiac arrest comes without warning signals. It's not what we hear about in terms of a heart attack where you get a tingling in the arms and a tightening of the chest. The cardiac arrest I suffered was because of electrical systems in my body that were malfunctioning. I had no warning, absolutely no warning. I was an avid runner at the time. 350,000 Americans suffer a, cardi suffer a cardiac arrest every year, and every minute without CPR decreases your chance of survival by 10%. Every minute decreases your chance of survival by 10%. It is only through CPR and defibrillation that you can come back to life from a cardiac arrest. So on behalf of all of those who have benefited from the emergency services in our area, on behalf of all of those who have benefited from the great work of the American Heart Association, I'm here today to say thank you very much for continuing to recognize the important work of CPR and those who are our first responders. Thank you. Thank you so much for your, stick around for, for a second, Jenny. Uh, we, we have some, but I want to add real quick, when you talk about the importance of the CPR class, another part of that, and this isn't the heart, but it's the Heimlich, that when they teach you CPR, they teach you the Heimlich. I've been, I've worked on a rescue squad as an EMT for 44 years. I've done the Heimlich three times, never on a call. It's, you just happen to be in the right place at the right time when you need to know what to do. And so that's a real important part of that uh, class as well, in my mind. I thank you so much for stressing the importance of this and, and your <laughs> amazing story. Commissioner Boyle. Well, I, I want to reinforce what you said. It's very important. I think I'd like to add to what you said. Uh, I had a, a heart attack and uh, died at, on the table at uh, St. Joe's on, in uh, October 20th, 1984. And I was at a dinner with Ann. She was being awarded. The kids were all there, her parents, my parents, everything. And I turned to Ann and I said, what, what pain, what arm do you get a pain in when you're having a heart attack? I'm feeling kind of crummy, you know. So she told me I left arm and stuff, and I didn't tell her I was having a fellow I was having a heart attack. And finally I said, uh, I'm going to have the police officer with me take me to St. Joe's. And he did, and I had a heart attack in the car, about uh, a very serious heart attack, right close to uh, 30 Park Avenue and Dodge, and as we were heading, roaring down Dodge Street. And I got to St. Joe's, and I was being treated, and... Uh, I asked a firefighter in the room to get the priest for the last rites, and he did, and the priest gave me the last rites, and I died, and they brought me back. And it was a shock, the same thing, and there was a fellow straddling me trying to do CPR. So it is really, it's real. Listen to your body is another message I'd give in addition to what happened to you. Um, listen to it, and you'll get some signals sometimes, and don't pass them off. For women, it's a lot different. Pains in your jaw and other places, and so get educated on it, and... Um, get trained in CPR. I'm really glad you're here today. Indeed. Thank you. Indeed. Thank, Thank you. Yes, for being down. Other comments? Yes. yes. Commissioner Kraft. Yeah. <coughs> Back in late 1989, I thought I had the flu. January 23rd of 1990, I hit the ground shoveling snow. And when I got to the doctors, he said, you've had a heart attack, but you didn't just have a heart attack. When did you have a heart attack? And they'd tell that by the enzymes in your blood. And they decided that my flu symptoms were the heart attack. Now, I, I don't understand that. I'm not a doctor. You know. <clears throat> I'm not a car cardiologist, specifically. Back in... 2000, and, and I had, I've had numerous interventions since then. Back in 2007, uh, I was alone in one of my stores, and I felt jaw pain, and I felt the heavy chest, so I knew what was happening. And being alone, I didn't want to leave the store unlocked, so my daughter was called and came up, and I passed out in her arms just as she propped their doors open for the squad. Thank you. 
and, and you might see this a cute little story, I don't know. In the squad, I kept hearing them say he's non-responsive. <clears throat> and they said, bag him. Now, I had no clue what bag him meant. I thought they meant they were going to put me in a cadaver bag. Guess what? I was in the cath lag from 31st and Leavenworth to UNMC in very few minutes. And they did tell my wife that there was a possibility, a very good possibility, I wouldn't live. After a lengthy recovery in 2017, just three years ago, um, I was in the hospital six times, twice for heart operations. And, and I have to say, Omaha's, Omaha, we are blessed by having some wonderful cardiologists and cath labs and medical people here in this community. So yes, it's important. I've never had arm pain. Mine was always in my jaw. Or one time while I was on the table, uh, I had a heart attack also while I was on one of the tables. <clears throat> Mike, Mike wants, thinks I'm talking too long. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I will, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, no, no, you're right. Further comments? Okay. Um, Is there anything else you wanted to say? You know, I'll just, I'll just thank you. I'll just end by just saying thank you. Um, you know what? It's these stories, and thank you for sharing your stories. And it's these stories that make us want to do more and be more as an organization and work with each and every one of you to make a difference in our in our communities. And um, I know that I, I say it from the bottom of my heart. We appreciate each and every one of you and what you do for our community and how you continue to work with us and community partners to truly save and change lives. So thank you very much from the bottom of our heart. Thank you Thank for you. coming in for all you do. We do have a resolution on the agenda. I don't think we have a motion yet to approve. Motion to correct. approve. Yeah. Oh, boy. Good luck picking out two names from that. Everybody moves. Everybody seconds. Could we please vote on a resolution recognizing February as American Heart Month? Motion passes 6 to 0. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your patience. Thanks a lot. Can we get a picture of that? Sure. Sure. Most of us wore red today in honor. Thank you all for that. Uh, with that, I am going to bring us back to the public discussion about public discussion. Um, and <laughs> there is no motion. There is no action intended to be taken today. This is simply an item on for discussion. However, this is the opportunity, if anybody would like to address this board on this item, this is your opportunity. Good morning. Hi. Hi. I'm Nicole Claire. I actually live in Bellevue. Um, but I've been very involved, as you know, for the last year and a half. I'm looking at the sign over there that says, we work for you. I find that very interesting. So I never went to a meeting before a year and a half ago. And in this last year and a half, I've even been drawn into Starby County meetings where they did do what, what you are proposing to do. And um, I understand you're bringing up Starby County as a model to do this. And I brought up Douglas County as a model not to do it. <laughs> because if, they, if you had, I think Jim Cavanaugh would totally be silenced. The building would be up. And everything would go as the majority of you would like it to go. Um, so 
Over the last one and a half years of attending, observing, and watching meetings, official citizens, and the news connected to such meetings, and listening to all these people, even the ones with whom I did not agree, I have not seen or heard anything that would support quieting or muffling the citizens' right to speak. These citizens are your constituents, essentially your employers. The only people who, whom I have seen or heard who are for such an idea are people like you, the officials who have been voted into office by the people with a capital P. If it wasn't for the people, your bosses, you would not be sitting there. You would not have a job. I could see why you don't want us to speak anymore. Over this last year and a half, we have majorly slowed down, if not thwarted, the building of an insufficient downtown kids jail that is overpriced, the plans and projects for which did not receive open bids. Again, this is the largest fiscal expenditure in Douglas County history without any say from your bosses, the people, any vote. I don't know of any job, at least a healthy, respectful workplace, where the employee is allowed to basically tell their employee to be quiet, to shut up, as well as give themselves races. If you are not working for us, then who? If you are not listening to us, then who? The people are still watching. They are still listening. <laughs> we're not going away. I feel like this is on here just to see if we're paying attention. Yes, we're still paying attention. I've missed you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brian Smith, who has come to public meetings, yeah. also said he has tried to write Mark Kraft, who never responded, and calling um, Commissioner Boyle is not a substitute for getting up here and having it on the record. And as far as um, Commissioner Boyle asking for what do we do, I would say let the people come up and say we want it on the agenda. It's simple. Maybe it's time for you all to be a little quiet and listen to us and decide, okay, do we put it on the agenda for next time? But to completely shut us up, we'll see what happens at the polling booth. Thanks so much. Thank you. Is there anybody else wishing to address this discussion item on the agenda? Hi. You're a good team. I'm Norma LeClaire from Bellevue. Concerning the public's right to be heard, you are going to emulate Bellevue? How many times have they been right? We protested there too. What we said was, just because you want to do it and have the power to do it, doesn't make it right for your public. When we show up week after week and wait three to four hours to be heard, pay for our own parking, and without being on somebody's payroll, we definitely have something on our mind and we deserve to be heard. Our concerns also deserve to be documented. How does that happen if you proceed with this travesty? How many people would have to sign to assure an agenda item? That would be a real rule. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. May I make a brief comment, Claire? Okay. I, I, I do want to say to um, uh, Nicole and Norma particularly that uh, we are not trying to copy Sarpy County or Bellevue. We, don't, uh, we do not believe in uh, actually what, this is, what the agenda item says. It's, it's, it is, was crafted to get opinions to help us, help us figure out a way how we can talk to you. Just like this, meet, this uh, discussion today, if this were under that agenda item that says, okay, anybody come on down and talk about what you want to talk about, we have to sit here like the dummies that you think we are, okay? And we sit here and can't say a word back, we're gagged, and uh, it is, isn't right because we owe you and you deserve explanations for what we do, and um, it, it just is, it, it is unacceptable for us anymore to uh, have to sit here in silence. I called the uh, Accountability Commission because I thought they were the ones who ruled on this. They weren't. I talked to Frank Daly, the head, and he gave me the name of the person over at the Attorney General's office, someone who works for the Attorney General, uh, who came up with this and, and uh, spoke to our lawyer and said, uh, this is the way it should be. So uh, it, it is something we need to figure out, and I think the legislation, LB 1167, is a good way to start it. And we can maybe modify the open meetings law so that uh, you know, we talk about legislative items without putting the items on the agenda right now. Maybe that's illegal. 
we bring up items and say we want to talk about, you know, doing something with uh, whatever it may be, you know, juvenile justice or something, and you, nobody has any notice of any of that when we bring that up. Toward the end of this meeting, we'll probably do that. So I want to thank you for coming, for expressing your views. Continue to express your views. We're going to try our darndest to figure out a way that we can have a conversation with you and not this one-sided thing where we uh, can't converse with you. That's just unnatural. So uh, I want to thank you all for coming, and I hope that uh, uh, you don't view this as a ruse or uh, some kind of publicity stunt. It's not. Uh, we need to find a resolution to this, and I think we will with your help. So if you have any other ideas, please uh, call, email, uh, do whatever you can to tell us uh, what we need to be doing to make this more open and uh, how we can talk back and, and converse with you. Not talk back in that way, but converse with you. Thanks a lot for coming. I approve your view. And I can't thank you enough for coming so many times. And I'm sorry to drag you out and cause the inconvenience. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Kraft. Yes, and, and this is, um, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, um, Commissioner Boyle is right on target. We do not want to stifle free speech, but we do want people to be, to be able to respond to people. Last week there was uh, something brought up about uh, United Nations, if I remember right, something brought up about refugees, about making refugees assimilate to our culture. Um, Mike and, and Jim, you guys talk about your Irish culture. You need to assimilate. Uh, the, should we get rid of the Italian American Association? What about Chinatown? Yeah, I wanted to respond so badly last week. You know, we got Chinatown in many different cities. Should we wipe them off the map? They haven't assimilated? We were talking about Muslims and their, their head coverings, and we were told they should come off. But we don't make nuns take their head coverings off. So, you know, this is why it's brought up. We want to be able to respond and talk back and say, hey, you're wrong, or we have this. The same thing is going back a number of years. We had some people who wanted to get rid of Judge Sirkovich, and they used this as the platform week after week after week after week when it really didn't relate to the governance of Douglas County. It related to the courts. And we engaged in conversation. And I would get a call from an attorney saying, boy, I wish I'd known that was going to be on the agenda. I said, it wasn't on the agenda. Had I known you were going to discuss that, I would have been there. But it wasn't on the agenda. So they didn't know we were going to discuss it. And the attorney general, I believe it is, got on the case and said, hey, if you're going to discuss it back and forth and have talk, it should be on the agenda. And that's what brings us forward. And Commissioner Boyle is right. We need to find a way so the public knows and we know and we can respond. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think, and apparently the appropriate response when we feel a compelling need to respond to something that somebody says is to say, I feel strongly and I would like to respond to this next week and I'm going to put it on the agenda. And incidentally, uh, my policy is that until I get burned on it, any commissioner is free to put anything on the agenda. I'm sorry to be accused of uh, this tyranny that I supposedly uh, bring, but every commissioner, it, anytime you feel something strongly, you are welcome to put on the following week's agenda a response to this comment so the world knows. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ms. Sorry, Mr. Chair, if I may, real quick. Uh, just there was a email sent that uh, from Brian Smith uh, basically asking for the item be withdrawn, and I just uh, wanted to note that that's in the record for this item. The, the item was only listed for discussion, so there's I know, no I know, action but he, to I just, withdraw. So, okay. I understand, but that's just... I, thank you. Commissioner Kavanaugh. 
Yeah, there were numerous emails. And I'll forward them to the clerk along the same lines, objecting to this uh, muzzling uh, resolution, um, which has now been before this board twice. Uh, it's a funny way to encourage First Amendment free speech by putting amendments on that shut down free speech. I don't think that, that was the purpose of this amendment, but every time that it comes on and the public has heard, um, the folks who propose it back off. What we really need is a permanent fix, which is real rules for the Douglas County Board that allow real public transparency and public input, and hopefully uh, we'll get those soon. Thanks. Just so the world knows, we have rules. We've had commissioners before who love to say, we have no rules. We have rules that we modify, we adopt. All the time. Um, they, they are, we try to keep them updated. So we do have rules that this board has voted on and accepted. We are now moving on to the next subject. We're going to now move back. Who's in charge of this meeting? Commissioner Kavanaugh. Who is in charge of this meeting? Is there, a good is there a rationale for letting the chair run the meeting? Or should everybody? Rules, Ms. Mr. Kavanaugh, could we ask you to please be respectful like most legislative bodies? Thank most you. legislative bodies respect each other and respect the rules that are in place. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you. We will now come back to the consent agenda on the agenda. Uh, Second. Okay, we have items A through H. Does anybody have any items on there that they would like pulled out for individual attention, questions, comments? If not, could we please vote on the consent agenda? I'm sorry, did you just ask for citizen comments? On the consent agenda. We're voting on the consent agenda. I vote yes. Uh, motion passes six to zero. Thank you. Now we have a uh, resolution, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think Pam's in here, one, one of our wonderful long-term great employees, uh, Pam Murphy, is going to be unfortunately uh, stepping down soon after her 30-year career with Douglas County. And we have a resolution honoring her as our juvenile assistance coordinator. Uh, is there a motion to it? Second. Okay. Uh, Pam's terrific. Pam is wonderful. I'm sorry yeah. she's not here to receive this. We're going to... She will be missed. She yeah. will, with the Criminal Justice Management Council and everything. Yeah. Uh, could we please vote? I vote yes. Motion passes six to zero. Thank you. This brings us to citizen comments. Uh, would anybody wish to address this board on any item not on the agenda? This is the opportunity to do so. And we won't comment. <laughs> Good morning again. <clears throat> Larry Store, 5015 Lafayette Avenue, Omaha, 68132. Refugee resettlement. That was a little bit of one of the issues last week that also had me a little upset. Because of all of the misunderstandings and emergency meetings going on about the executive order 31888 which basically reset the rules on refugee resettlement. Yes, last week I mentioned the UN United Nations because up until now, they controlled who was leaving a foreign country and where they were going. There's an upper level of refugee agencies. There's another level, refugee aid resettlement agencies that deal with us here in Douglas County. So my first statement is, in regards to K apartments, those 500 refugees did not speak English, did not write English. A refugee agency was responsible for helping them get settled. They got paid for that out of taxpayer dollars. If that was in such bad condition, why were they allowed to settle in those apartments in the first place? Then all of a sudden we had an emergency. We had to move them out of there because the mayor said so, or Ben Gray said so, and find out that it's dilapidated. I don't know that that was Mr. Anderson's fault. He wanted a contract just like anybody else, but somebody 
not on this board or somebody not in the op mayor's office went down there and signed agreements to settle those in those people in there. Don't put it on him and don't put it on the slum landlords. We heard about that a long time. Well, thankfully you've stopped using that term lately. But yes, there's a lawsuit involved. And uh, that's an interesting one. But anyway, I have in here a timeline. As early as December 6th, a refugee agency was consulting with, words matter, the governor about the problem of refugee resettlement and how to do the new process under executive order issued by the president and a letter sent out by the Secretary of State with a completely different choice of words, completely different language as to what it was about. And it was about drastically cutting the numbers, but also drastically increasing the vetting. The, the agencies claim they vet it. Well, unfortunately, they don't know how to vet, maybe. And too many people were coming in that weren't wanting to assimilate to our culture. It now will be, in the language of the executive order, your option and the mayor's option and the governor's option, which, by the way, everybody said this is up to the mayor. No, it was not. It said state governments and local governments, which means the board, but also the city council. So there should not have been any confusion about that. It was very clear starting in December of the 6th of last year. The agencies were coming to you people and telling you, here's a letter that you need to draft into a resolution or a state law saying that you will be, you will continue to be a welcoming city. That's not what this was about. It was about telling the local cities and those small towns out there where the United Nations was dropping people in in the dead of night without anybody's knowledge and didn't have resources to, to take care of them once the 30 or 60 or 90 day period was up. That falls on them and it falls on you and it falls on my billfold. It wasn't done right. It wasn't done right by the refugee agencies. And then they want to come at the last minute and convince you that, oh, the Secretary of State said, I have to come to you and tell you what to put in your letter and tell you what to put in your resolution. No, that's not the case. You all had the opportunity as of September 26th to understand the new federal law. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Does anybody else wish to address this board under citizen comments? Okay. Um, the Finance Committee, any, anything to no, bring to our sad. attention? We talked to Joe about starting the, uh, I think the letter's going out or something. We were talking about doing some preliminary work, so we're getting a pretty good start on it. And uh, we're going to be, I'm going to be, and I know PJ as well, three of us are going to be looking very closely at expenditures to see what we can do to maybe... Uh, do some priorities and ask the board about mental health and so forth, what we can do to further support that or better support it. Thank you. Um, that brings us then to the Douglas County Youth Center report, where our staff has been patiently waiting for two hours now. <clears throat> Good morning, Brad. Good morning. Thank 
I'll let Mark fix this, but uh, thank you. All right. Good morning, commissioners. I'm Brad Alexander with the Douglas <coughs> Douglas County Youth Center. Um, first, I know I was scheduled to report last week, and we were in the middle of our PREA audit, <coughs> and so I appreciate you being flexible and allowing me to come back this week. Um, I did leave my glasses at the youth center, <laughs> and Mark was kind enough to let me use his. It turns out, <laughs> always prepared. Turns out your eyes are much better than mine, Mark. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we will start on slide number three, please. <clears throat> 2019, the calendar year 2019, we had nine students earn their diplomas while at the youth center. Um, did have one just this past Monday as well. It was really awesome. I think uh, there had to have been at least 20 family members, don't you suppose, that showed up for that. And it was, uh, it's just really cool when a mom tells you that she never expected to see this day. So um, to be a part of that is pretty special. We have two kids that, uh, two students that are currently enrolled with the Metro Community College. Um, slide number four. So the last parent-teacher conference was held in uh, in January. We had 34 parents that uh, that participated in this conference, and that represents a 50% participation rate, which is which is really really good. Um, and we appreciate those parents taking the time to come up and learn more about what we're doing with their their children academically. Slide number six. So we held a, a parents meeting on January 13th, and we didn't have any parents. We didn't have any parents show up. Um, so some people got creative, and it just happened to be that uh, we were doing a the parent-teacher conferences at that same time, from January 13th to January 17th. So we just took that opportunity to ask if any of the parents wanted to take part in a parent meeting during that time, and and six of them took up took us up on that, and so we did get an opportunity then to to spend some time and, and hear from, from the parents, which is always appreciated. Slide seven. We've been after this for a long time. Um, nice. Marianne, I think, would be happy, but uh, yep. February 4th, actually today, right? Yeah. Um, the foster grandparent Great. is uh, is actually at the youth center through um, Eastern Nebraska Office on Aging and spending time with, with our young people, um, which I think is great. There's just... Uh, something to be said about those gener generational relationships which which some of our the kids that we serve don't always have so it's nice to have somebody with some life experience spend some time with the kids slide number 10 please and i'm not going to go through all this it cover it'll be on the next three screens but i thought uh, kind of a end of the year first of the new year report just to update you on the services and programs that are provided at the youth center. So at your leisure, um, just take a look and, and if you have any questions, feel free to, to give us a holler. So we'll go to slide 13. I'm good. <laughs> you can stop me anytime you want though. Thank you though. Um, so those are the average daily population, average length of stay and admissions. Um, since 2013, and again, we chose 2013 as a kind of a starting point because that was the year that status offenders were no longer securely detained, so it seemed like a, kind of a good baseline moving forward. Um, 78 was our average daily population in 2018, 79 in 2019. Um, the length of stay, uh, don't really read a whole lot into that. Um, we changed that number and included everyone. Previously, we were just calculating length of stay for those kids that were with us over over 24 hours. So moving forward, we'll have a baseline on that. <clears throat> um, slide number 18, please. So speaking of length of stay, um, for those kids, when they do stay with us more than 24 hours, um, if they were not on probation, excuse me, not on probation, their average length of stay is 41 days. 
for the probation use it's 52 days for the kids that are in adult court 80 days and uh, overall when a youth stays with us more than 24 hours um, the length of stay is 46 days next slide and this is for those youth that are with us less than 24 hours um, the numbers that you see on the, the right the average those are actual kids actual admissions um, through the course of a month so for those that stay with us less than 24 hours the number of juveniles not on probation we get about 19 we average about 19 admissions for them each month for the number of juveniles who are on probation less than half 0.42 per month the number of juveniles in adult court just shy of two at 1.9 per month and those <clears throat> those admissions when they stay with us less than 24 hours their average length of stay is four hours next slide 20. so the adjudicated and pre-adjudicated those would again would be referring to youth that are in juvenile court so the adjudicated youth um, those admissions are down from 2018 which was 375 to 307 that's a decrease of 18 percent the pre-adjudicated youth um, up from 416 to 548 that's a 32 percent increase pre-trial um, youth down from 119 to 92 that's a 23 percent decrease um, sentenced youth down three percent from 13 to 9 um, and our overall admissions up from 923 to 956 which is a 3.6 percent increase slide 22 please classification of admissions delinquents again those are the the kids that are in juvenile court this is one area we're always and I hopefully you'll give us feedback too. you have in the past and I'm sure you will but if there's things that you're interested in that you're not seeing here please please let me know but one of the things that that we want to do <clears throat> going forward in 2020 is to break down delinquent so you can actually see what that looks like um, those are kids that are in juvenile court but are they felonies are they misdemeanors and how does that look so we're going to look to to try to break that down further for for us and for you um, for example <clears throat> January 31st just this past Friday we had 76 kids at the youth center um, so the delinquent youth would look like this 27 of those would have been on felony charges 15 were were on misdemeanor charges so that would be a total of of 42 and on that day we actually had 34 kids well 32 kids that were in adult court in Douglas County <clears throat> and two that were in uh, federal court but the, of those 34 all of those were were felony charges so we're going to do a better job going forward to break that down for you a little bit a little bit more um, slide 24 please uh, excuse me one moment Brad uh, Commissioner Boyle uh, you know so uh, and I bring this up I think most meetings and I just want to ask you this and try to get give me an answer if you can and I think uh, Greg who has the table that shows the offenses and everything everything but their names uh, the thing that's concerning and there are people in the audience who talked about the juvenile justice uh, shift that is uh, apparently coming uh, the thing that's uh, concerning me and I'd like you to repeat uh, what you said about the the level of offenses of the uh, let's see 851 people or young people who were brought into the facility that are considered delinquent mm -hmm. would you say that again and particularly address uh, the back of the room so they can they can hear this and okay. write this down I mean the offenses are pretty serious would you go ahead and do that break that down by felonies and so forth and federal yeah. we are going forward we definitely want to do a better job of breaking it down and we, we did a we took a snapshot on last Friday January 31st on that day we had <clears throat> 76 people at the Douglas County Youth Center of those that would have been in that category um, of delinquent 27 were felonies um, 15 were misdemeanors so 42 of the 76 that were considered delinquent um, break down like that 27 and 15 the other 34 were all felonies in adult court so on that day we would have had 61 kids in the youth center on felonies and 15 on on misdemeanors so I the question that I want to ask is what is being proposed to treat uh, children you know and when, when there are arrest when they are arrested they've got these we've got these programs to divert them 
into supposedly and to uh, other other situations so they're not locked up what I'm concerned about and I still am is you know how do we how do we uh, we've got 34 felonies in adult court is that right Last felonies and, and what are they gun possession and assaults and things like that um, we'll get to the, the most common offenses that we see but uh, yeah assault assault on officer domestic assault I'm sorry I can't hear you Assaults. I'm, I'm sorry, the assaults, a variety of assaults would be, uh, they actually passed robbery this year at our, so that would be our number one offense, and then robbery follows that. Possession of controlled substance with the del intent to deliver, theft by receiving, followed by gun charges, theft by unlawful taking, taking burglary, terroristic threats, un unlawful occupancy, and sexual assault. Okay, so how do these children fit into the rehab programs that we're proposing? to take the place and drive the numbers down. That's what makes me a little crazy. So anyway, I, I, and sometime uh, we've got to have an answer to that because if we're heading toward the building this facility, we better, we better be sure we know what we're doing. And I don't mean to say that in a way that's uh, derogatory, but I, you know, I've long felt that what we should do is get the programs in place and get them working and then move forward and make changes. I'm con still concerned about that. So. I bring that up, but I don't. I don't see, and I, I guess I'd like to ask you or somebody, uh, maybe Kim, Ms. Havacati, about what we do. Uh, are, do these children qualify for these diversion programs we've got planned? And I don't need an answer now, but sometime we need to talk about it in public. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner Kavanaugh. Question. Thank you. Uh, these are going to be familiar to you. Some quick metrics. So, the um, admissions for 2019. If I'm reading this correctly, uh, 956. Um, the average length of stay, I'm a little confused because on a couple of different places it has a couple of different numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's page 18, page 17, which shows an average length of stay of 46 days. And that's the same on page 18, but I thought. You had mentioned uh, 27 days is the average length of 27 stay. 27 is the average length of stay when we count every single kid that steps foot in our door. Okay. The 46 would count those kids that were with us for more than 24 hours. Okay. And uh, the average daily population, 2018 was 78, 2019 is 79. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So you know, virtually no change. As a matter of fact, gone up a little bit. Uh, much bigger average daily population than the proposed kids jail downtown would accommodate. Um, and the 2020 average daily population is 79 as well. So, you know, we're looking at a basic 80 kid population there and it's not moving. The minority population, and I appreciate you putting this graph in there in the last few months on page 28, Minority population, 76%, 76%. And that's up over a 10-year period from 2009 when it was 62%. So we're actually moving up based on the 10-year look back in terms of the minority kids we're locking up. Um, those are, you know, I hope reliable numbers taken from this report. Is that pretty much right? I, yeah, I stand by them. And the mention in here of um, mental health services, psychiatric services, UNMC, Charles Drew, Creighton, and Douglas County Youth Center on page eight. Do we have a child psychiatrist, psychologist there on an eight hour, even an eight hour a day basis? Not on an eight hour a day okay. basis. No. Um, we have contracted for services, I think with Charles Drew, for less than one full-time equivalent doctor uh, to serve this population of 80 kids. Is that, is that right? That's the total number. Uh, right. Currently it's four hours, but uh, we're going towards eight hours. Towards eight. So the doctor, through that contract, as I understand it, will be eight hours a week. I'm sorry. Eight hours a week. Is eight hours a week. <coughs> So, uh, and that's this uh, Dr. Zucha. Zuha. Uh, Zuha provides med management and rights evaluations for the youth. That's medicating these kids. That's not counseling these kids, right? These kids aren't getting 
psychiatric, psychi psychological counseling from anyone. Is that pretty much correct? There's from any psychiatrist or psychologist? It's more of a med management piece. I mean, a lot of our kids show up at our door and they right. haven't necessarily been consistent with taking their medication and sometimes right. that's a yeah, little bit Just of so it. we're clear, there's no provision of actual psychiatric, psychological help that these kids are receiving. They're getting meds, but that's... We do have the LMHPs through Region 6, too. Right. And we're, we're talking hope. We're talking MDs, psychologists, PhDs. Right. They're not there except for this eight-hour-a-day thing. Correct. Thanks. Thank you. Please continue, Brad. Um, let's move then to... Let's just go to slide 26, please. So this is the reason for admissions in 2019. 67% um, 60 of our admissions were for new charges. And then violation of probation and capius or an unlawful absence, which also would, also would be probation, combines for about 29%. Um, and then 4% or less than 1% juvenile court holds, 4% failure to appear in juvenile court, and then less than 1% for failure to appear in county court. I think the interesting thing on this slide is the 29% that is combined for probation. Historically, that's been closer to, to 40%. And I think that's an, uh, what we're seeing is an effect from, from the legislation that makes it a little bit more difficult to violate the kids and place them in detention. But on the other side, we're seeing new charges uh, going up at the same time. Slide 27, please. So these are the, and I, I think I just went over this. I don't know that I need to do that again, but of the top 11 offenses that they account for 88% of our, of our admissions, assault, assault on an officer and domestic assault is 16%, robbery 15%, which was interesting because uh, robbery has always been the uh, most common offense for us, and, and this year it was passed by the assaults. Possession of a controlled substance with intent to deliver at 11 percent, theft by receiving at 10 percent, gun charges 9 percent, theft by unlawful taking 7 percent, burglary 5 percent, terroristic threats 5 percent, un unlawful occupancy 4 percent, sexual assault 3 percent, and obstruction of a peace officer 3 percent. Slide 28, Commissioner Kavanaugh was referring to, so in the, the African American admissions were up 4 percent from 2018. Um, Caucasian admissions remained flat from 2018 at 24%. <clears throat> Hispanic and Mexican admissions actually dropped 4% from 2018 to 2019. Na Native Americans were down 1% from 3% to 2%. Asian actually jumped from 1.6% in 2018 to 3% in 2019. So, just a quick... Commissioner Cavanaugh. Look down on that, thank you. Um, and this is great because it goes back for the last decade, and you'll see that we're at 18% Hispanic, Mexican, American now in 2019. In 2009, that was 9%. Uh, we're at 53% African American now. In uh, 2009, that was 51%. We're at 24% Caucasian now, and in 2009, that was 38%. So there's been a huge shift away from Caucasian kids to um, minority kids over that period of time. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Slide number 30, please. So the home program, the number of uh, admissions into the home program increased by 21% from 2018, um, 126 in 2018 to 153 in 2019. Um, their su successful completions actually increased by 51%. Um, over that same time period from uh, 65 in 2018 to 98 in 2019. And uh, the average daily population for that program was 22 in, in 2018 and 24 in, in 2019. Sure. Slide number 33. Excuse me, Brad. Yes, sir. Alexander, could I yeah. ask you to, in this home program, uh, this kind of goes to the question I brought up many times, can you uh, tell us uh, what the offenses were of the, and also, if you have it, the racial, the ethnicity of the children who were in this home program. 
uh, is that somewhere on your slide or I'm the, the offense is no but I can get that for you um, the only offense that's excluded is a, a gun charge Gun other, charge. Than, other than that they're they're eligible the the courts make them eligible for the home program okay I'd like to know what yep, those what charges are because yep. uh, maybe it's something we need to be uh, talking we have a really good juvenile court operating now I believe and uh, some excellent appointments and uh, so I'd like to maybe we need to have some talks with them but okay. if you'd let me know what that is I'd appreciate let the rest of the members of the board know as well on page 30 what that who those children are and you can see the uh, the racial breakdown for the home program on slide number 32 32 yes sir 57 percent african-american okay. 20 percent helps caucasian and and we would hope to see more minorities represented on the home program because right. honestly that was one of the re that was the program was started in 1999 through a dmc grant as an attempt to try to bring down those numbers in detention and I, I think it's it's for the large part has done that or at least helped I think the char the charges to me are important because I, yeah. I'm really concerned about who we have in the facility their charges are so serious that they don't qualify to that concerns me a lot and they only work with the pre adjudicated use so once they're adjudicated they get turned over to probation so okay. but we can get you the charges for thank you mm -hmm. um, slide number 33 please Academic credits earned um, up from 770 in 2018 to 779 in, in 2019. Those are the full credits. The partial credits dropped slightly from 129 to 113. Um, so they held pretty steady with a, with a population that was pretty consistent over the course of those two years. Slide 35. Sorry to interrupt. Could I ask you uh, what, what kind of, uh, what happens to the, uh, uh, people who are uh, partial credits and uh, this is something that uh, mark and our educational department advocated for over the last few years because uh -huh. <clears throat> you know our kids aren't always with us long enough to earn right. one full credit but we felt strongly that they should be rewarded for their efforts right. in any regard so if they earned a partial credit they should be that should be awarded to them and uh, and the school district has has allowed us to do that okay so are they then, uh, is there someone who helps them get involved in where they're supposed to be going to school or are they automatic go to Blackburn or someplace like that or they go to North or No, South? they go back to, I mean, there's, there's occasions where they'll go to one of those schools. Often they go back to their home school. Or home school, and, okay. Yeah. I just want to be sure we've got the full cooperation of the public system. The relationship that. between us and, oh, we work with eight different school districts, but uh, I, I, we're, we're doing well in that regard. We ought to they're, ask the private, they're good partners. We ought to ask the private schools to step up too. Yes, sir. Seriously, if I can help with that, I will. So count on me. Thank you. Um, slide 41, please. Boy, that'd be a big deal. So youth that uh, show up at our door on medication, um, the most common medications that we see at admissions are the antidepressants, um, we average 19 of those youth each month. Um, psychotropics, we average 13 admissions each month. Uh, stimulants, we average 10 each month. And the asthmatics, um, we average nine admissions each month. Slide 42, the psych psychiatric diagnosis, um, the most common being a substance abuse disorder. We average 24 admissions um, there each month. Conduct disorders, we average 21 admissions each month. ADHD, we average 11 admissions each month. And mood disorders, we average nine admissions each month. Can I ask you about uh, post-traumatic stress disorder? Are those uh, head injuries and uh, other abuse that occur? Or? We've had a couple that, that were brain trauma. And, and, and some of them, well, a number of them are actually kids that have witnessed shootings. Witnessed shootings? Yes. So what are we, what are we doing to, I know we've got some good treatment, but uh, what happens when they uh, leave our facility? I mean, is that okay? I think that's going to be the nice thing with the, we, we've, we've done a lot in terms of trying to remain some, so, somewhat of a presence in a child's life when they leave. The Charles, the Charles Drew um, contract is going to be real helpful in that regard. Um, they've got a navigator that's going to make sure that those services are in place and they're available and accessible to these people when they leave. 
You know, I saw something on uh, one of the master programs. I don't know if it was Sunday morning or not, but it was really interesting because they had a, a man, a psychiatrist, who, uh, after he treated people, he would, uh, uh, after a short period of time, two or three, four weeks, less than four weeks, he'd send him a note and just say, uh, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. And they showed on television people, these were adults, writing back, I'm in trouble. I need help. Some two or three of those that come back like that, I'm reaching back out. Just that little bit of contact. I, I'd like to see us try something like these kids, mm -hmm. probably through email or something or text, but say, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. And I know it's HIPAA is involved and stuff, but no, some way, really important. yeah, some way we need to, that let, that touch is really mm -hmm. amazing what happens because mm -hmm. they, they're having trouble. They so somebody's caring about them. Yeah, yep. okay. Yep. And it does say that we care about you, what's going on. Exactly. So think about trying to implement that some way. Yep. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Slide 44. Sexually transmitted diseases. Um, so we tested 527 kids in 2018, 591, <clears throat> excuse me, in 2019. So that was a 12% increase. Um, so while we tested 12% more kids, um, it was nice to see, although it was modest, it's still a dec decrease from 61 to, to 59. So our testing went up and our, our kids that tested positive dropped, even if slightly, that's, that's a move in the right direction. Um, and that ends my presentation for today. Commissioner Rogers. Thank you. Um, before Greg comes up, I want to make a comment on a couple of points that were brought up and just be sure to clarify this. So if we can go to page eight, uh, that's the, the, the update on the Drew report. There's a comment made that, um, you know, seems to imply that we're just medicating these kids. That's not the issue. That, that's not how the program runs. What happens in the program, one, um, as you read in it to some degree, um, Drew's hired three licensed mental health practitioners to carry out some functions. They're there for the period of time, and if they and basically that time is based on need. If more demand comes, that time increases. That's not limited by anything. So basically, the process is as, as demand increases, it goes. Okay. How the process works is it's meant to lessen this kid's time that's in there because what was happening is that, as Brad and those guys were saying, um, you get a kid that has a psychiatric diagnosis or whatever it is, and if they have a dual diagnosis, Dr. Zuha was brought in to kind of handle that situation, put this kid on the proper medication, and then that kid can be served out in the community in Charles Drew's mental health program. That's what it's meant to do, speed up the evaluation time and not have the detention center becoming a de facto med management factory. That's what it's supposed to do, and that's what this will allow the speed up to do. Uh, the number of hours is based on need, and that will increase. Um, if we can go to page 13, um, it's fair to look at the detention number as a, uh, as a uh, measurement, but we came here two months ago, the number was at 96. I say that to say, and this is going to sound contradicting, it is a measurement. But I look at this number every day, and I had to tell myself, looking at this number is like weighing yourself on the scale every day. <laughs> you could be 190 pounds today, 186 pounds tomorrow, 195 pounds the next day. It's one of these things you look over in the long term. And the fact is, is that if you want to say what true need is, 35 kids, at least from the report that I see today, uh, 35 kids are in there on adult charge. That's the true kid that needs to be in there, the adult charge kid. Everybody else should be out, and that's the goal to get them to some okay. degree. In regards to your question for programming, and I'm sure she'll answer this when she gets more acclimated and meets with all the people that have something to say, and that's uh, Kim Avocati. There are plans for the programming piece. If you look at page, if I can find it here, the pre-adjudication page, that page is page 18. The number of kids that are juveniles not on probation, that's pre-adjudicated kid. For years, we refer to this kid as a county kid. There's a plan right now. She needs to assess this thing and really come. There is money there, but what we're trying to do is she's making the rounds to make sure we spend this money in the right places. 
but pre-adjudicated kids, this kid that's staying 41 days is target number one. From the numbers that we have data-wise, that is a kid that is heavily representative of color. That's a kid that Judge Brown came to the meeting, the last Child New Service Committee we had, and said, they're ready to do something with this if we need to program it. So yeah. that is ground one. Currently, there uh, is the DMC grant, uh, or Racial and Ethnic Disparities grant that we have through the Fed. We have uh, $200,000 remaining in that. That will be the start of the money to implement programming through that. And the judges and everybody are ready to work on that piece. Okay. Um, and pre-adjudication is like target number one. We get that, then the focus can go to probation for some degree. So also the point two, and, and it's, you know, when the point's made about adding up the kids on certain felonies, I, I think the proper mark is the adult kids. I know it's meant up every time, but there are kids that may be on there like terroristic threats that are kids saying to you, I'm going to kick your butt when we leave. And sometimes that label, oh, no, no. well, you know, <laughs> that label is a ter terroristic threat. I know. It could be options. So the more number is the adult number. And lastly, this question is brought up every time, and I think, and I had to get some thought to it. And, and, and the health department brought me to my solution on this, or, or the, the philosophy behind it, uh, a theory to get around this thing. Health department has been doing some work for the last three, no, probably last year, on a diversity uh, committee to really get at equity in the realm of public health in the starting department. They brought to my attention a approach called the groundwater approach that they're interested in. Basically, this is what the groundwater approach is. If I'm in, a, if I'm in one lake and the fish in that, die, that lake dies, I got to look at that lake. If there's a surrounding uh, neighborhood and the fish in that place starts dying, you got to look at that. If this bigger area of fish start dying, you got a groundwater problem. And basically, the groundwater effect basically is a metaphor for saying you got a bigger problem than Douglas County and juvenile justice. The groundwater effect and the structural effect, if you look at the GIS mapping on these kids that are in there, basically covers the northeastern part of the city. So when the question is posed here every week about this issue, the question is not just posed to us. The question is posed to everybody in the system who apprehends, who makes the decisions, all the feedback as far as housing, health, and all of this, it's not a county problem. So that question has to be posed to all the structures. Put a map of those kids in there, most of the kids don't have health care. That's why they're in here getting the service. That's why we're trying to connect them with Drew for a medical home. So that's the answer to that question if it comes. It's fine to be asked here, but you have to pull in some more pe people to solve that. Um, so that's, that's just the points I wanted to make. Thank you. Thank, thank thanks you, very much. Uh, Commissioner Kraft. <clears throat> yes. Okay. I'm impressed to see a 50% participation in the PTA. Yeah. That was very impressive. Mm -hmm. And I think over the term, this will start more parental engagement that will decrease your numbers. Now, I have a question on young people who are brought in with gun charges. Do we have any idea of knowing how many of those are with their parents, how many are with guardians, and how many are in out-of-home placements? No, I don't. Is there a way we can find out? We would probably have to read through the, the police reports okay. um, to ascertain that. It'd be interesting if parents would just take the initiative. Okay. Greg's kind of shaking his head like he, he, I think he knows something that I don't, so. Okay, Greg. All right, he might be able to help you out with that. Okay. Yes. If parents exactly. would be encouraged to take the initiative to inspect their children's cars, rooms, the houses they live in for weapons. Now, I realize some parents are afraid of their children. And that's sad, but it is still their house. Go on. The kids will tell you that uh, they plant the weapons in the neighborhood. Uh, they're ne and they tell you they will tell you that they're never more than five minutes away from getting their hands on a gun. Okay. 
And Commissioner Rogers was talking about the groundwater effect. And, and I read that report, and it's very enlightening. And, and part of it is, as he said, the intake. There's no food in the refrigerator. This was mentioned out in that report. And the social worker sees that the food in the refrigerator is moldy or there is no food. And it says, well, that's because the refrigerator may not have worked. So the child gets put in out-of-home placement because the parents don't have money to fix the refrigerator, and the landlord won't fix it. So as Commissioner Rogers says, and I'm glad Commissioner Kavanaugh's paying such a, so much attention <laughs> to what Mr. Uh, Commissioner Rogers has said, because this is so important. Oh, I guess he's not paying attention. Okay. Uh, but yeah, it, it's so important. And uh, I don't know if other commissioners have read that report, no. but I think no. everybody should see that. Uh, Commissioner Rogers, do you have that on your? Would you please? Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, on page 68, I think it is, on this thing, you, it's beyond your report. There's a graph that has something that I find interesting. Uh, general information under gender ba breakdown you have males and females then you have a little red star that comes off in point zero zero that's, that's, uh, the oh. that's on the uh, oh okay that's the other that that's, we don't have okay that's the one we don't have right It'll maybe email it to us if you want or something. well I was curious what that little cone that is outside the circle is about. Do you know what I'm talking about? You know what? That's Greg's. Greg? Right. Greg, get on up. <laughs> oh, no, whenever you're ready. I think that was really yeah. good. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Did you uh, did you get all the way through? I am done. Mm -hmm. I am done. Okay. Uh, any further questions? Comments yeah, question. for Brad? Or uh, is, can you get this Brown? on the internet for people who want to bring it up, or is it in the uh, I know it's on the agenda that I received, but can you get it someplace where people can access it, or can they already? Uh, Dan Esch, County Clerk. Well, the, the when you go to the agenda, you know, there's a C yeah. attached link. Uh, both his report and Greg's report coming up are uh, out there already. Okay, you don't have any, you don't have anything on a, on our county website as uh, youth center or anything where you can attach. We could put it on the, the Douglas County Youth Center Would website. You do that. Yep. That'd be easy for people to find yep. on this. I think. Yep. Thanks. All right, very good. Right, thank you. Thank you, Brad. That was Thanks quick. a lot, Brad. Okay, uh, the only thing we got Greg coming up. Oh, oh, okay. We do. Thanks. Thank you, Brad. Good morning, Greg. Good morning. Good morning. Greg Hepburn, Douglas County Youth Center expediter. Um, so again, my presentation is just uh, at a glance as of Friday, January 31st. And um, as Brad mentioned, we were at uh, 76 youth on that date. Just some um, general information and breakdown. The first breakdown is uh, racial breakdown, and we had 41 African American youth. We had 17 Hispanic youth. We had 11 Caucasian youth. We had um, three Native American youth and four Asian American youth. And um, that that is an uptake for Asian American. Um, that was related to two specific incidents where actually five um, juvenile were de juvenile Asian American juveniles were detained, and uh, one has since been released from that. So uh, that's the reason for the higher uptake in the Asian American population there. Um, outside of that, the gender breakdown, we were at 68 males and eight females, and we've since had, uh, I think, three young ladies uh, leave from that point. 
And uh, let me backtrack a little bit too. Um, I think this may answer Commissioner Kraft's question. Um, I have absolutely zero idea what these <laughs> zeros <laughs> are. <laughs> um, I actually looked at my report when I went this morning to make sure, because uh, as I was studying over this last night, I didn't see anything in my in my report, but on page two, page three, and page six, uh, there were some zeros on there, and they have nothing to do with the report. So I just want to kind of <laughs> interject that there, and I apologize about that. Um, moving on to page three, uh, that at age entry point, uh, the numbers continue to be the same. Seven, 16s and 17 year olds are our highest um, for 16 year olds. We were at 35 of our youth, 17-year-olds were at 19, and then from there uh, we go 15-year-olds who were at 14, 14-year-olds uh, who were at 6, and 13-year-olds who were at 2. In terms of zip codes with either three or more uh, youth detained, we were at uh, 68111 was the highest, and that actually overtook placements. Um, which we're at 14. Uh, placements dropped down to six this time, and um, 68104 was at seven. And then, in addition to the six where placements were, we had uh, 68104. Now, with that one in particular, um, there's a specific uh, gang within that area. And there's a lot of activity within that gang, and so uh, that may be part of the reason why there's an uptake in that uh, that specific zip code. So, and then all the rest kind of fall in suit as well. On to page four, the length of stay breakdown according to pre-adjudication, probation, adult court, and others. Others being um, hold for other counties or other states, and um, also federal court cases as well. So as you can see, the juvenile over the past one to 30 days, juvenile specifically has been the majority of um, cases. There was one case where it was a juvenile and adult case. Um, with that specifically, <clears throat> the trends had been in the past 30 to 60 days, we had a high number of adult cases or adult and juvenile cases. That since over the past 30 days has changed. We have not had um, anyone come in under new charges with specifically just uh, adult charges. So that, that's positive in and of itself right there. Um, you can look throughout. Um, the one thing that kind of uh, caught my attention and so I dove into it a little bit deeper at the 181 to 360 day mark, um, you definitely don't want to see any juvenile charges specifically in that range. Um, so as I dug into each specific case, there are three specific things that have kept them there. Uh, the first one, one of the juveniles was uh, on a motion to transfer to juvenile and that was successfully transferred to juvenile court from adult court. Uh, the second thing is one of the youth is actually on hold for a, um, a, an adult charge in Sarpy County, uh, but has a juvenile court case, and, and that was pre-adjudicated with uh, Douglas County. Uh, the third one <clears throat> has other charges pending where um, there was a violent incident that occurred at the placement that he was at. So those are the three things that are keeping those specific juvenile-only cases here with us. Um, outside of that, uh, the only other thing is, um, the, again, the high number of adult cases. And the one thing that I'm looking for uh, now over the next, you know, 30 to 90 days with a lot of these cases is the motion to transfer from adult court to uh, juvenile court and what the, the racial makeup of the denials and the confirmations that will occur. Outside of that, page five, um, Brad went through the type of court and ran through some of the numbers in terms of juvenile offenses. So 
I'll uh, forego those and then jump right into the evals ordered. And this is in correlation with some of the services that have um, been uh, brought to us as well, too. So we have 68 youth who at this point or at the point on Friday did not have any evaluations ordered. We have six that were ordered and then two are completed. Now that number in terms of completed uh, evaluations, I think that's significant because you want that number low because if we start accumulating youth who have evaluations that are completed and their length of stay is increasing, then we have an issue that's going on there. So that number being low, that page is page five. And it's the, the third bar. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Jim, could you talk softer? Yeah, Kavanaugh. 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 Kavanaugh, could you talk softer? Please we, talk softer. Or, or, or take, step outside. Or take the discussion out of the chamber, please. He's not hearing a word of this. He's almost as loud as you are when we're trying to listen to you, but he is oblivious. Okay. Shall I proceed? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, the other, uh, the last bar on there is. Um, release orders. We have 70 youth um, who had, do not have any uh, release order, and then we have six, three of which of those since Friday had been, um, had been released. So that's positive. On to page six, uh, this is a breakdown of offenses. So 41 of the youth that were detained um, were detained on violent charges. Uh, we have 16 who were detained on nonviolent charges. And then again, the um, description that I utilize specifically for this graph is to the left side of the um, chart itself. But in terms of potential for violence, um, meaning that maybe there was a gun charge, um, and so the potential, the capacity for violence was there, but there was no action that was committed. Um, we had, we we're at 13 youth, and then the last one, the, the, they might be there for a violation of probation or some type of capius, and um, there were six youth there where they, they were detained, and even though it wasn't a violent charge in which they were detained this time, their original charge was a violent charge. So just thought that is important to just kind of give a depiction of, you know, who is in the youth center now. Very good. Thank you. Page seven, pre-adjudicated youth. Now, um, our numbers here show 16 pre-adjudicated youth. Um, and that is, it's the same, but it's different from the seven that Brad indicated, because I actually have that uh, number seven in my report as well. But what it is is, 16 youth arrived that are that are in Douglas County uh, as of Friday arrived pre adjudicated but have since been adjudicated and so just wanted to make sure so there were nine youth that were actually adjudicated during the time that they were uh, detained with us um, of those 16 youth three of them uh, were uh, they were sedated so they returned to us again half after um, already having been there uh, seven of them are current, and so that's why I, I wanted to use that number, currently uh, uh, pre-adjudicated with us. Um, in terms of the length of stay, we have five youth who are in the typical range, the one to 30 day mark. We have one youth who is there from the 31 to 60 day mark. And we have one youth, again, who is there 181 to 360 day mark, but again, that youth is a SARPI hold, and that hold is on adult charges in SARPI County. Page eight, probation youth, and I apologize, that number 46 is actually um, a typo, it's 42 uh, that we're at, and of those 42 probation youth, um, 26 are there uh, for having picked up new charges. 33 of those youth uh, were readmitted to DCYC. Five of them there were, were there on a violation of probation. And in terms of capius, there were nine unlawful absences. There were six failure to appears and one combination of unlawful absence and failure to appear. And then two of them uh, were there for, um, for uh, felony locates for, uh, for adult charges. So that's kind of the breakdown there. And the last page, Page nine, 
um, top five reasons for delayed release. I'm not really seeing much change in terms of that. Uh, we have the evaluations. We have um, 70 youth who do not have an eval ordered, but six youth who do. We have the um, court delays of 30 plus, which is it's re been reduced quite significantly. And I'm sure there's an attribute, uh, there's some type of attribute to uh, finally being uh, having uh, more adult, our juvenile court judges. Uh, motion to transfer the breakdown on that. Uh, we have nine youth who are currently waiting on motion to transfer. We have four youth who have um, had their motions to transfer denied. We have two youth who have had uh, their appeals actually approved, one of which are the ones who are within that 181 to 360 day time frame. And um, now he's going through the uh, juvenile uh, process in juvenile court. Um, and then we have eight who are awaiting uh, their pre preliminary hearing. So uh, just keeping an eye on those and then kind of diving into those in the future in terms of racial breakdown of what that motion to transfer will look like as well. Uh, and the last thing is um, we have nine youth who are there on um, who are HHS holds and just kind of being aware of how long, what their average length of stay is for those youth uh, who are involved with them. And then we have two youth who are federal holds. And that is uh, a summation of my report. Commissioner Boyles. Uh, I have some uh, some questions. You know, they, for example, uh, what are the nine youth on HHS? What are they? What are those? Why are you holding them? What are they? What do they do? So like runaways or something? Uh, there's there's a variety of um, the variety of them of of reasons why they're there. Um, but the one thing that I want to uh, display is how many youth who are um, on H, you know, who are either HHS and probation or HHS specifically are there for a delayed uh, period of time. That's uh, the only reason to... Uh, delayed to, period of time? A delayed period of time, correct. Okay, well, one of the things I want to ask you about is, um, I mean, I appreciate your report. It's very uh, informative. Thank you. Uh, you know, what I, I'd like to hear you say is that uh, when you read these things, uh, tell us what's good and what's bad. I mean, is it good that we have nine youth being held on with HA because they're involved with HHS. I don't know if that's a good thing or mm -hmm. a bad thing. I mean, are they children who are being treated or where? what's going on with them? You know, I guess I'm saying is I, what's good and what's bad because I, I don't know if these are, uh, these are good things or bad. Yeah, well, they, they could be either. Um, it could be a good thing if, um, if the, the length of stay has, has been decreased or if they are there for a longer period of time, it could be a bad thing. So the main thing is just denoting the fact that they are there. But I, I, that makes sense in terms of, of putting it in a, a, in a fashion that um, shows whether there's improvement or if there's reduction. I get, I'd like you to, if you would, I don't expect you to do it on every, every line or mm -hmm. anything else, but if you, you know, if you, if you, in the report, if you just make a comment that it is good that we only have, you know, this thing, sure. this thing happening and that, just casually in there so you can give us a little bit better me, a little bit better direction. Mm -hmm. The other thing I want to ask you, I don't know if you're aware of this or not or if you have the answer. Uh, in uh, district court um, years ago, it used to be you'd file a lawsuit and that was, you could just, I, I tried a case one time that another lawyer filed and it was there for seven years. And uh, it was awful. I mean, I, you know, training the witnesses when I had to represent this injured girl. Anyway, so they, the deal is that they, they installed later, which is really good, a progression calendar. And what happens is, you know, so the county attorney walk in, and what happens is they get, you get notices of, you know, you, okay, you got to take a deposition by this date, you got to do this, got discovery and all that kind of makes you do things, which, of course, is very good for lawyers. So, um, do you know if there's a, maybe this is out of your realm, but do you know if there's a progression calendar in juvenile court? Do they, do they tell uh, attorneys representing children that you have to have something done by a certain date and they uh, talk to uh, the prosecutors about things being done? Is there, a, I guess I should ask the, the administrator. There, there is, what? I'm not sure specifically what they are. Um, Does anybody here know mm -hmm. that? I'll, I'll ask uh, uh, the administrator. Okay. The, oh, it'd be great. Please, Don. Please do, Don.
Your timing's perfect, as usual. John Klein, Douglas County Attorney. In the district court, we have the speedy trial statute, so we have to try the case within six months. Right. And also, in the juvenile court, each judge has a progression list of their cases okay. that they keep track of just to see how long things have been in abeyance or waiting with a petition that's on file. Okay. So they keep track of their own, for the most part, the court administrator does also okay. so that the cases get moved. And then there's also, my understanding now is that we have an expediter, somebody who's in, in yeah. the facility right. that's supposed to kind of keep track and keep things moving from the standpoint of people that are detained. Do you know if the if the uh, uh, attorneys representing the children are are they part of that? They get notices that they have to do things by a certain date, or is that even a part of that system? Well, sure, they get notices if the court wants to move, set a hearing, okay. and get the case moved. Uh, uh, there's pre-trials, there's trial hearings, hearings, whatever kind. They're going to get notice about those. Okay, that's good. I, okay. I just. I didn't know. Sure. Sometimes you see these kids sitting there for 80 days. You wonder what's going on. You know. Right. Sometimes, one of the one of the, the issues with the juvenile court system right now is, and I, I've talked to juvenile court judges about this. It takes sometimes up to what six weeks to two months just to have an assessment done on a juvenile. Hmm. That's I just talked to Judge Brown and Judge Kaler about that the other day, and they said it, people need to understand it takes sometimes it takes that long for yeah. us to get some somebody assessed. Got it. And I don't know if that's something you guys have seen also. Yeah. Thanks. That's very helpful. If I may ask, is there a way we can speed up that assessment? Well, that's part of the efforts that are going on right now in the, in the system is to try and uh, speed up the, uh, that process uh, so that things can get moving. Uh, that's, that's part of the problem is, is that sometimes there, there aren't things happening quick enough for the youth to get assessed, whether it's mental health assessment or whatever it might be, so that we can get the case moving. And I, and I think most of us are aware that we're trying to speed that up as part of our programs we're bringing in. Right. But some people don't pay attention, don't realize that we're working on these. So thank you for pointing that out again. Sure. Thanks, Don. Thank you, Don. Okay, th thanks a lot, Greg. And I wanted to let, finally ask, can you put this, get this on the internet on your site as well? Yes, yes sir. That'd be great. Thanks a lot, and thanks for numbering the pages, too, both of you, all of you. Good afternoon, Mark. It's good to be here. It's uh, good to see you all. I just want to touch base. Uh, there, there are efforts in place to uh, move uh, those uh, evaluations along, and, and it's, uh, it's still underneath the, the same contract uh, that we, we have uh, with Charles Drew. Uh, and uh, as we add CHI underneath that Charles Drew contact, a contract. The intent is to have providers that are also probation providers that are, that are at the youth center that are providing the psych, uh, uh, some services for youth. And they will be able to be requested uh, that they do the eval uh, through uh, the Department of Probation. So they, in fact, will uh, get an opportunity to speed things up a little bit uh, as a result of, of having the Charles Drew contract uh, tracked and uh, UNMC and CHI uh, services with us. Very good. Thank, Thank you, Mark. Thanks a lot, Mark. Uh, Commissioner Rogers. The pages, when I went to the variable, uh, page five, mm -hmm. what does variable one, two, and three mean? So the breakdown of what those are are to the right. Um, so the variables, the chart would not allow me to enter any more data in there, and so specifically what they are is to the right here. Um, so, so one is type of court? Yes, correct. Two is delinquency status? Delinquency status. Three is? The evaluations ordered. Okay. And, and the, re the release and of the other ones. And so, so variable one would be uh, juvenile. Okay. Court variable two would be um, adult. Variable three would be adult and juvenile combination. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Right. Okay. Very good. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Keep up the good work. We will move next, finally, down to uh, legislation. Busy season in Lincoln. And uh, Marcos? Kind of turn things over to you. What in particular should we be paying attention to? 
Marco C. Martin, Douglas County Legislature and Labor. Um, so before the board today, um, it is on uh, under the committee there. You have how many items I have on? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Should be seven bills there, and all of these bills um, are bills that uh, I guess we're putting forward as a recommendation to support. Two of the bills were filed on our behalf specifically. Uh, on the county's behalf specifically, the other bills are either consistent with our priorities or are something that um, we see as um, that, that the county should should support in Lincoln. It would help us, you know, provide some benefit to us. And, and I'm happy to summarize or answer questions about the bills. I know I forwarded it, forwarded all of them along with the, a copy of the bill last week, but. Uh, Commissioner Kavanaugh. Marcos, when um, these bills come to us, have they been uh, recommended for action by our legislative representative, Mr. Kelly? Yeah, sure. So uh, Sean Kelly has reviewed all of these bills, and he agrees that these bills should be supported. Okay. Any motion approved? Yes. So moved. Uh, motion to support, and that's all six bills listed on the agenda. Seven. Second. Second. So all seven of them. Should be seven, I think. Oh, seven's on the on the next page. Thank you, thank yeah. you. It'll be One, eleven six. Three, four, Excuse five, me. Six, seven, yeah. Okay, we have a motion and a second, Commissioner Boyle. I I, I, well, I want to ask about another bill. Should I just let this go first? Yeah, let's okay. get this one okay. uh, addressed first, if we may. Uh, questions or comments to any of these seven bills? Uh, Mr. Chair, who was the second on that? Uh, I was Commissioner Kraft. Well, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay, Kraft. Okay, uh, and if there are no further questions or comments, could we please vote on that? Motion passes six to zero. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Boyle. Uh, yes, I uh, read with um, pleasure that the uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, Nebraska is going to be supporting uh, what has uh, what the city council adopted some time ago about equal treatment for uh, lesbians, gays, and uh, bisexual people, transgender people uh, being welcome in Nebraska. And I, I just want to let the board know that I intend to testify in favor of that uh, bill, and I'm not representing Douglas County unless uh, you feel that uh, you are comfortable uh, looking it over and deciding uh, before the hearing that you are supportive. Uh, the other thing I today uh, uh, I received, as we all did, we got a uh, uh, the bill that's introduced by Senator Albrecht, LB 1167. I am going to talk to uh, the senator about uh, what that would do to uh, uh, opening up our meetings here and being able to respond to people. Maybe there needs to be an exception to the open meetings law. Just like we discussed legislation, just like I brought this up, this was not on the public agenda, this LB 1167, neither was the gay, one about gay rights. So we do this exception when we talk about legislation, but we don't, you know, we don't have anybody talking to us, I suppose. But anyway, I, I do intend to speak in favor of trying to figure a way around this. Um, so I called the Attorney General's office, but I didn't get a, a call back. I got a call from our legal counsel instead. And, I just, I don't know why she didn't call me and talk to me about uh, why the attorney in Lincoln didn't call me. So in any event, I uh, uh, don't need to hear any more about uh, what we're, the trap that we're in about not being able to speak. I'm trying to figure a way to get out of it so we can be more responsive. But I will talk to Senator uh, Albrecht about this. So I just want to tell you I'm doing that. Do you know when the hearing on, on that is? Neither one. No, I don't. Either one. Do you know, Marcos, or can you find out? We do have, I mean, we've run into this before on yeah. legislation, that it comes up so quickly that we don't always yeah. have time to get it on the agenda, and that's why a few years ago we put in this disclaimer yeah. saying we may take up things that aren't even on the agenda yeah. for legislation. Yeah, I know it. Uh, we try to put it on the agenda when we when we can. Um, yeah. All right, yeah, sure. I'd be curious to know when the hearing is on, on that one. Yeah, so 1167, um, yeah, Open Meetings Act, um, Albright, it, it looks like... There is it is not the hearing date is not specified. It was it was referred to the um, government, military, and veterans affairs committee, and a, a, a hearing date has not been okay. Uh, um, okay. Assigned yet. Then we should have time for this board to. Yeah. What consider. was the other number, Commissioner? That you you know I don't know the number. I should oh. have, but it's, okay. uh, I think it's six something. That helps, doesn't it? Um, it's the uh, one the chamber of commerce adopted to support. Uh, rights for, as the city council voted here in Omaha, for gays, lesbians, okay. transgender people. I'll, I'll have to. Yeah, just give me a call or send me a text. Okay, okay, thanks. I'll, I, I can find it, too, for that matter. 
Anything else for the good of the cause? Panzine Brooks introduced it. Oh, okay. The executive session, we do have need for an executive session. We will be discussing negotiations, litigation. Hmm? I'm not sure. What? Nothing under personnel. Yes. So, okay, Mr. okay. So, personnel, litigation, and negotiations. Okay. I would entertain a motion. Second. Thank you. Motion and a second to go into executive session to discuss personnel, litigation, and negotiations. Could we please vote? I vote yes. 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 Motion passes six to zero.